So welcome everybody. This is uh, the 20th anniversary of the EVTT school, Electroporation Based Technologies and Treatment School. And this year we have uh, uh, some special events. One of the special events is this uh, round table. The round table which we prepared together with colleagues from the FDA uh, and in particular Xenia Blinova here with us. And of course, uh, uh, with uh, the, the presenters with, without who we, we just couldn't do it. We believe the time is right. What we need to really, what we would like to address, and you have seen this slide before, is we would like to address if there are any safety, efficiency, and regulatory science knowledge gaps in the field of cardiac ablation or knowledge gaps all in all, not, not just regulatory. Do we understand enough? So bringing together the regulatory agency, uh, the uh, industry uh, representatives, and of course the, the academia uh, has uh, actually prepared quite, uh, I would say, a, a vivid, uh, not yet, but hopefully vivid round table. So my name is Damian Miklaucic, and I'm also uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, head of this uh, uh, school. So the aim that we uh, discussed with, with uh, Xenia and, and, and Maura, uh, so Xenia Blinova and Maura Cassiola from FDA, and with Bar as well, uh, Bar Coast from our uh, uh, lab, was actually to bring the key stakeholders together and uh, to discuss whether, you know, we know enough or we don't know enough or are there missing gaps uh, what is the, the what are the hurdles that we need to, to 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 cross to jump over in order to get this treatment, which seems to be very safe and efficient, to the patients as early as possible? Yeah. Now there are, of course, uh, 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 questions, and we see uh, uh, the questions are arising as the PFA has been uh, uh, implemented. But of course, uh, we uh, need to know. Uh, when it's enough, and what is the best way to approach this. The insight generated from this roundtable uh, discussion will uh, be used, and we hope it's going to uh, uh, be fruitful enough to kind of pave the path towards new tools, new discussions, and uh, make the progress uh, faster. Now, as I said, why here? This is 20 years of school of electroporation. So I firmly believe that we have uh, the, the, the competence and we have the people who are coming here lecturing to actually uh, uh, be able to help you, uh, industry, the phys physicians, electrophysiologists and FDA to speed up the process. Now, we have an excellent panel uh, uh, David Hazelwood from uh, FDA, Maura Castiola from FDA, and Vivek Reddy will join us online. The rest of us are here in person, and we're going to be, of course, uh, included in the discussion. And online, we have uh, uh, the three speakers I mentioned also online. In particular, I would like to welcome uh, Scott Meyer from Boston Scientific and uh, uh, Daniel Sieg from Medtronic as the representatives of the uh, companies who are uh, one of the leaders in the PFA uh, development. And of course, then we have the esteemed, uh, 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 I would say, academics, uh, Rafael Davalos, uh, uh, Tony Ivora, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we have a little bit younger colleagues, also very esteemed, uh, uh, Samo Machnic, Kalamiza, and, and Borkos. And I will uh, uh, use a little bit of time myself at the end again. Uh, Atul Verma and Vivek Reddy, as uh, persons who have done, who have experience uh, with patients, I think their insight is invaluable. And without them, the, the debate would be pretty much uh, 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 so much of a lesser value. Now, uh, this was, uh, as of this morning, as you can see, uh, announcing this round table and preparing this round table has triggered quite an interest. And in particular, we have almost 60% uh, 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 registrants from, uh, from uh, the companies, from industry. 
Uh, and of course, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, interest from around the world, to be honest. The, the workshop and the whole school is supported by the team uh, of EBTT, that is mainly uh, our colleagues from the lab, and the multimedia team from the University of Ljubljana, Faculty of Electrical Engineering. Now, let me try to start somewhere, and I would like to start actually long, long time ago. And this is 1982. It's exactly the same time when Eberhard Neumann, also here with us, coined the word electroporation and published the first paper using that word. And at that exact time, I would say, uh, there was an attempt to use uh, DC discharges, yeah, so direct current discharges, to treat uh, uh, heart conditions, heart fibrillation. It was abandoned, uh, and the, the reason was, of course, because that could be detrimental to the tissue and to the patient. Yeah? So it was not until Jacob Levy with Boris Rubinsky in 2007 published a paper which actually also triggered very much my interest, and not only mine, but uh, around the, 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 the globe, uh, that they showed that actually you can do use electric pulses to ablate tissue while preserving some of the structure within the tissue. So that was very interesting and very intriguing, but it seemed like nobody's picking up. Doesn't matter. Let's leave that to the history. But what is now different from the 80s? I don't think that biology, physics, or chemistry have changed or evolved in these 30 years. Not at all. 40, sorry. But I think the technology and, and mostly the understanding and the knowledge that we have has evolved considerably. So let's start from we understand what is going on and then we'll see how much we understand. Now, and this is the very last that I'm gonna say. It's funny, well, maybe not funny, curious, we have three systems approved for use in EU, none in USA. And this is now three years, yeah, I think, if I did the math correctly, roughly. Now, why is there a delay you know, <laughs> giving PFA to patients in US, whereas patients in Europe, they have it. So if that is so such a safe and efficient tool, why not having it available? So is this because FDA is over cautious or it's because notifying bodies in EU are, are, are being reckless and, you know, irresponsible? Or is it the manufacturer is just preparing, preparing files that are, you know, just not thorough enough. So with that, I would really like to start, and I would like to invite now uh, the, the first speaker. Uh, and uh, so David Hazelwood from FDA, uh, welcome, and please, the floor is yours. Hi, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm David Hazelwood. Um, I have some introduction slides, if you wouldn't mind pulling them up. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so I'm David Hazelwood. I'm a lead reviewer in the Office of Cardiovascular Devices. Um, probably, if you are a company interacting with the FDA uh, with, you know, irreversible electroporation or PFA, uh, you've probably talked to me or I've at least sat in on a couple of meetings. Um, if you're in that space and you haven't talked to me, you should send me an email and we can have a, a quick chat or something. Um, but uh, yeah, go ahead and move on to the next slide. And so just a quick background of where we're at. Um, you know, FDA, we have interacted with a number of stakeholders. I don't have too many details that I can share. We have a lot of confidentiality rules. Um, you know, right now, as you correctly stated, there's no uh, commercially available PFA systems. Um, but we do have a number of them uh, either in ongoing investigational studies, clinical trials, or that have actually completed their clinical trials. Um, you know, obviously, some of these pivotal trials have finished, so um, it's, you know, there's a process that needs to go through. I can't share where we are at in that process, but, um, you know, the company has to put their uh, 
final proposal and everything together and they have to submit it to us and there's a review process. Um, so go ahead into the next slide, please. We do have a number of programs that we've utilized uh, so far for these type of devices um, or, you know, are looking to apply to new devices. We have the first and most common one is our Q submissions program that lets anyone can just uh, submit questions to the FDA and we will give you real answers. Um, you don't have to have a finalized device. You can be very early on in development. Um, you know, even if you are not a typical uh, device manufacturer, maybe you're just a someone looking to do a study or something like that, everyone can come talk to us. We're happy to answer questions, do a little research on our end, give you formal feedback. Um, and then Breakthrough Devices Program, that's another one that there's been a lot of interest in. Um, that lets devices which are more effective uh, for life-threatening diseases, which at this point we have recognized, um, we have recognized atrial fibrillation as a, you know, potentially life-threatening device or uh, disease because of, you know, stroke and long-term outcomes. Um, but for that program, what we are looking for is that your specific device has an advantage and, you know, not just the idea that, you know, electroporation in general has advan advantages, but that your very specific device that you're going to make is going to have advantages. Um, kind of the follow on to the Breakthrough Devices program is a new one called the Total Product Lifecycle Advisory Program or TAP. Um, that's a program where uh, it basically comes with all the advantages of Breakthrough, plus they work with you to discuss with payers, um, get involved with a lot of people outside of the FDA ecosystem to get your device to market sooner. And then finally, I wanted to throw a pitch in for the Early Feasibility Studies Program. That would be like a first in human study. Um, we have really been working hard to develop that on our end here at the FDA. We've heard that in general, FDA is not the cause of delays for getting a first in human trial. Um, and also, I happen to be one of the representatives. So at the bottom of this slide, you see an email for the OHT2 early feasibility mailbox. I'm the one that's going to answer that. So um, if you're looking at a first in human study, um, there's definitely some conversations we can have and some help I can provide. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So very quickly, I'll just highlight a few regulatory gaps. Um, I wouldn't say that any of these are necessarily deal breakers for this technology, but they are things that we're looking at very closely. I think no technology is going to be perfect. Um, and, you know, there's no reason why we could only have a perfect uh, electroporation technology to go to market. Um, but we do carefully want to consider the risks associated with like coronary spasm and damage that's been published. Um, here at the FDA, we have concerns about possible interactions with coronary artery disease. Um, you know, if someone's already susceptible uh, to these things, what happens if you do just a little bit more damage? Um, arrhythmia induction is something that we've been very cautious about. Um, tissue specificity, you know, at a high level, we understand the theoretical advantages of, you know, uh, cardiac tissue being more, you know, specifically treated than the esophagus, but um, we do think that there's a little bit more that needs to be proven there um, in order to really understand exactly the factors that go into tissue specificity and how to optimize that perhaps, um, which really gets us to these waveform parameters. That's a big um, question for us where, you know, for now we can treat each individual waveform as a black box and just look at results. And that's, that's one approach that we're moving forward with to get this to market faster. But um, you know, there's almost an infinite number of waveform parameters that you can adjust in a in a pulsed uh, setting like this. And so even if I just take two generators and test them both, they're not going to have exactly the wave same waveform. And so it's hard to say when the variations in waveform become significant or when they still say equivalent. And obviously what we want to avoid is just doing a long clinical trial for every single generator that comes out or every minor modification that happens to a generator. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, optimization, that's something we're very interested in. I think everyone's interested in, but we also recognize that it's extremely difficult. You know, as I mentioned, it's a n-dimensional problem where there's as many parameters as you want to vary that you can test out. And so how do you optimize a, a very complex waveform parameter like that. Um, so those are our regulatory gaps. Like I said, um, we're trying to 
go to market just based on results. Um, but these are things that we are considering carefully and that we're doing everything we can to kind of collect as much information as possible um, while hopefully not delaying important technologies getting to patients as soon as possible. And that's it for my slides. So uh, we have, uh, of course, the, 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 the questions potentially, I mean, opening just at the, you know, the concerns, coronary spasm, arrhythmia induction, and so on. We're going to be addressing that later on, I'm sure, uh, Atul, Vivek, uh, uh, and, and Tony will bring this up. But there are many that uh, probably will not show up uh, immediately in the first, let me say, few hundred patients within the, within the clinical study. So is that something that actually should be deferred to the post-market uh, surveillance, or is this uh, we, we plan to, to, to see everything in advance? You know, I, I can't speak for specifics, um, but in general, I think this is a new technology. It's very likely that there's going to be post-market studies. Um, we've typically been doing post-market studies even for just traditional RF catheters. Um, but, you know, it, it's not just will we look at this in the post-market, but how are we going to look at it? You know, what type of endpoints do we want? What type of uh, imaging and diagnostic uh, testing do we need to do so that we can capture this information um, as robustly as possible? You know, because if there are issues, we want to catch them in the first, uh, you know, hundreds of patients, not, you know, thousands and thousands of patients in. I think to add at this stage. So the next presenter, uh, Xenia Blino, also from the FDA. Xenia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitan. Good morning, good afternoon. Everyone, thank you for joining uh, in person and online. I'm Ksenia Blenova, Deputy Director of Division of Biomedical Physics, Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Everyone can hear me okay? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, here's my mandatory disclaimer saying that me and my FDA colleagues will be talking about our own views and on the FDA's views and policies. The mentioning of any devices or other commercial products is not an actual or implied endorsement by the FDA. Most importantly, um, the discussion today is not related to any specific regulatory submission and it will be focusing on the pre-competitive science knowledge sharing. So the mission of my office CDH Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, or also how we call it, is an accelerating patient access to innovative, safe, and effective medical devices through development of regulatory science tools. As per quote of, a, of our center director, Dr. Shuren, the challenge, challenge is that medical device technology advancement moves faster than the regulatory science used to device review. When cardiac devices using pulse electric field to introduce to induce irreversible electroporation in cardiac cells entered FDA review a few years ago, very little knowledge about the effectiveness or safety of this new approach existed at the FDA. So as the number of such devices growing, these questions became a high priority to the CDRH reviewers and scientists. So the goal of our office also is to close the gap between biotechnological advances in device development and regulatory review. This can only be done in collaboration with device developers, the key opinion leaders from academia, in the effort like this today's round table. Thank you for hosting them, Jen. Thank you to EBTT. Um, also has limited resources, and it's very important for us to identify the most important regulatory science gaps and challenges for us to focus on. Uh, these knowledge gaps may affect any stage of the PFA device development life cycle from discovery, ideation to post-market monitoring. Through the discussion with the panel and other participants today, we want to see if there are any opportunities for our group to rethink, reduce, or remove these gaps or challenges with regulatory science tools that could take a form of a new laboratory assay, computer modeling, maybe recommended best practices, or a number of other 
formats. The important feature of regulatory science tools or RSTs is that it's an innovative science-based approach to help assess the safety and effectiveness of medical device. They do not replace FDA recognized standards or qualified medical device development tools and DDTs, but provide resources to both companies and FDA reviewers in the areas where standards or MDDTs does not exist yet. So RCT can eventually evolve into MDDTs or standards, but those take a long time to gain consensus and often are not approved until the particular medical device category is well established, which means that early device developers do a lot of heavy lifting by themselves and RCT, RSTs here to share the load. To summarize, my objective today is to gather input on regulatory science gaps, challenges, or needs specific to assessing the safety and performance of cardiac PFA devices. I want to hear about scientific barriers or ambiguities in regulatory review of cardiac PFA devices that could be addressed or streamlined by regulatory science tools. In transition, my colleague, also scientist, Dr. Casola, will describe that we have been working on in the last few years in the PFA space. Um, one of the early challenges there was to get some insight on how the numerous parameters that characterize PFA could affect the final lesion dimensions. You know, there's voltage, current amplitude, pulse morphology, pulse repetition rate, and so on. Um, could we also prove a very basic assay that there indeed was a difference in the preparation susceptibility at the level of individual cells from different organs, such as heart versus esophagus, Based on our um, cardiac electrophysiology laboratory expertise with induced pluripotent stem cells that we have successfully evaluated for the regulatory use and drug safety review, we opted to extend this model to the medical device assessment in the effort that Mara will be talking about. This is an example of how a regulatory science tool may look like, and we would need your input and feedback on how to improve it and ensure adoption by the industry. Maura, the floor is yours. Can I, before Maura takes it over, can I just uh, ask, is it, are, are the PFA, I mean, the, the regulatory uh, science tools, uh, you have them for other devices, I would assume. Of course. Uh, uh, now, is, is, is our PFA devices so much different uh, or some of the tools that you have available can be used or, or these tools that you mentioned are so specific for specific devices and applications? So the scope of current regulatory science tool catalog is very, very broad. So there are um, 18 programs at also, and some of them are for neurology, some for cardiovascular, some are not medical area related, but rather technology related. I don't know, we have a program on artificial intelligence, machine learning, credibility of computer modeling. So. In cardiovascular space, we have a few tools out there, none of on PFA yet. We just had our first IPS, induced polypotent stem cell tool came out this year, and that was for cardiac contractility modulation devices. If you're familiar with this one, it's very interesting scientifically as well. So we hope to deliver the first PFA tool maybe at the end of this year or early next year, and Mara will be talking about this, but there are many more to come, hopefully, and with your input, we can decide where to where they should be in this area. So uh, I would like to encourage uh, uh, all the uh, 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 participants online to use the chat channel to, pr uh, to put, to type in the, the questions, and I'm going to try to then integrate them into the discussion as, as we will be coming along. So please use the chat channel. Now, uh, thank you, Xenia. And uh, let's uh, give uh, uh, the floor to Maura. Maura, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, thank you, Xenia, for the great introduction. I will be specifically talking about in general, in vitro testing, can it be used and to what extent, and in particular to the tool that we are trying to develop at the FDA specifically for pulse field ablation. Next slide, please. I have the same disclaimer that um, uh, Xenia already introduced. So uh, this presentation reflects the views of the others. It should not be 
construed to represent the US Food and Drugs Administration views and policies, the mention of commercial products, their sources, or their use in connection with material reported herein is not to be construed as either an actual or implied endorsement of such products by the Department of Health and Human Services. Please, next slide. Okay, so both uh, David and uh, Xenia mentioned that one of the knowledge and regulatory gaps that it's um, currently relevant for this technology is related to uh, the technical characteristic that are actually determining pulse field ablation outcomes in terms of safety and efficacy. We know uh, from a scientific point of view that um, parameters that influence the outcome of this technology are, for example, the catheter geometry, uh, for example, if the catheter is fo focal, circular, a basket, a flower, or any other shape, the electrodes geometry itself, the electrodes polarity, if we have, for example, um, unipolar uh, with dispersive patch or bipolar um, um, electrodes. Um, one of the key players is the waveform characteristics and parameters. So there are many aspects that influence um, the ablation volume and the safety concern related to electroporation applications uh, on soft tissues, on cardiac tissues, and are, uh, for example, the shape, the symmetry, the number of phases, phase amplitude, phase duration, interface delay, interpulse delay, pulse repetition period, uh, number of monophasic pulses in a train, number of trains per treatment, numbers of treatment per site. So as we know, uh, this scales pretty quickly. I'm not sure why this is going. Uh, can you go back one slide, please? Thank you. So here there is an ideal representation of a um, waveform. It's um, in this case, two biphasic pulses. And um, at the FDA, we decided to uh, develop a in vitro tool based on human induced pluripotent stealth cell cardiomyocytes um, that could give us information of what is what are the effects of these pulse parameters on uh, a cardiac model. We investigated a range of pulses uh, that is listed here and it's taken from literature. Um, it's, the phase duration goes from 0 0.2 to 10 microsecond. The interface delay is uh, fixed to 1 microsecond. The pulse number ranges between 50 and 400. The pulse repetition frequency from 2 to 200 kilohertz. The number of bursts in this study is limited to 1, so it's one train. And the uh, uh, pulse shape is limited to biphasic. So um, our assay, based on this set human cell model, um, it's um, um, designed such that we are able to determine what uh, is the um, ablated area following a given combination of these pulse parameters uh, um, around the stimulating electrodes that you see in as a represented here as circles, grayed out circles. So the red staining is meaningful of uh, cells that are permeabilized several hours after treatment, uh, meaning that they are dead and did not survive the treatment, while the surrounding green stained cells are uh, actually cells that are still alive and survived the uh, treatment. What can we obtain from these uh, data? So, of course, the ablation area and the ablation volume for a great given set of pulse parameters, it is specific of the geometry of the electrodes that you're using. So we wanted to have a parameter that was objective and independent from the um, electrogeometry and uh, that can, can be uh, quantified as the lethal electric field threshold for cell death in uh, cardiac cell monolayers. Um, um, how did we obtain and extrapolate this value from our results? Uh, by doing numerical modeling in static conditions of the experimental setup, uh, representing the, uh, the electric properties of the experimental setup. We computed the electric field distribution in the cell monolayer and by comparison of the area 
obtained from the fluorescence images to the um, um, electric field distribution, we were able to compute the electric field threshold of first cell that for each of uh, these uh, combination of set of parameters. While the method is already been published in two peer reviewed articles, the data that I'm gonna show you are um, unpublished. Please, next slide. Um, so what we were able to obtain um, from this study is a um, characterization of uh, the uh, lethal electric field threshold represented here on the z-axis in kV per centimeter as a function of the different pulse parameters, including the phase duration, the pulse per repetition frequency, and different pulse uh, numbers. So qualitatively, we were able to uh, determine that the lethal electric field threshold decreases with increasing phase duration. And um, it's not easy to see from this data, but we were able to do a fitting with machine learning of this data. And we have actually an increase, uh, even if minor with respect to the effect of uh, phase duration and pulse number, but we have an increase of the lethal electric field threshold with the um, uh, pulse repetition frequency. And of course, uh, as more pulses are added in the train, uh, there is a reduction of the electric field threshold. Um, so why do we want to minimize the lethal electric field threshold? Is because um, for a given ablation volume, if um, the manufacturer is able to reduce the voltage um, applied, given all the other parameters being constant, then of course there is a decreased risk in uh, uh, side effects such as thermal effects or neuromuscular stimulation. Um, please uh, go ahead with the slide. Um, so this data, as I said, was um, um, fitted with machine learning and we created uh, an online open source calculator. Um, these results and this method are um, under review to um, um, peer reviewed journals. And so this tool will be um, uh, open to users that can insert independent variables such as the number of pulses, the phase duration, the pulse repetition frequency, the density and electrical conductivity of the system that they want to investigate with the parameters that their generator are able to produce and uh, use it as an input of this calculator. And the calculator uh, will give, as a result, uh, the electric field threshold for cell depth for that specific set of pulse parameters, the PIXAR, the adiabatic heating, and the absorbed dose. So the idea here is to, uh, uh, from a user point of view, is to say, OK, instead of testing n number of uh, combination of pulses on animals. Let's do first a selection based on this uh, tool of a um, restricted number of waveforms that could be considered optimal and then can be tested on a small number of animals. So it's not aimed to completely su substitute um, preclinical testing. It's a support and a sort, some sort of streamlining for preclinical testing. Um, as you can see, we also give information on the apatic heating, which is the heating that is produced by the specific set of parameters in an adiabatic system. So this gives the worst case scenario. Of course, in real life, there would be some heat dissipation that would mitigate the uh, thermal increase that the calculator will predict, uh, but it is uh, uh, an indicator of um, how uh, changing pulse parameters could, yes, improve the decrease of the electric field threshold in one direction, but it might cause more heating in another direction. And so the idea is that the user can also do some differential study and verify that by changing certain parameters, uh, both uh, minimization of the electric field threshold and of the adiabatic eating can be achieved. Um, this will be the uh, available to the users as a uh, GUI tool, so an interface that can be downloaded and run on uh, everyone's computer. Um, please, I think I have another slide. Yes, um, um, go ahead, one. 
Thank you. So we know that there is a um, gap between results that are obtained in tissue and results that are obtained in vitro. So our current work is to validate our um, tool on um, animals, on a swine, swine heart, and um, based on complex modeling, uh, we were able to compute the electric field threshold for this uh, subset of pulse parameters um, that we used in vitro on animals, and com the comparison from preliminary results is pretty good. So what we expect is to extend this preliminary study to the range of parameters I showed you before and to verify that the trends are respected. So we don't expect exactly to have a quantitative match between in vitro and ex vivo results, but we expect the trends to still be valid and therefore uh, the in vitro tool to be able to provide um, uh, qualitative information regarding the changes in parameter and outcomes of the treatment. Uh, as Xenia mentioned, we have uh, several tools in pipeline. Um, we want to develop human-based tools to assess PFA safety, for example, coronary spas spasm and damage. We are thinking about the development of phantom-like tools to assess volumetric changes of ablation, lesion, and temperature increase as a function of pulse field ablation with form parameters. And we will be happy to discuss uh, other avenues uh, if uh, uh, you have any feedback or input. Thank you very much. So uh, we have one question. Uh, what is the effect of pulse parameters, nanosecond versus low microsecond pulse width on cell injury, cell death mechanism? Is the science understood? I think this uh, question will be uh, uh, addressed to 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 large extent by the next speaker. Uh, so I would defer this uh, question to to the next uh, uh, speaker. But before that, uh, I would like to to ask you one thing: uh, uh, the the shape of the pulse that you selected and the range of parameters. Uh, is, is biphasic at 0 0.2 microseconds to 10 microseconds. I, I wonder, is it this by chance, or what, what was the guidance of selecting these parameters? So it was actually one of the most, uh, um, in a way, tricky aspect of this starting this project. So most of the waveform parameters from industry are proprietary um, and are not disclosed to the public. Um, so this also, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, make these gaps even more relevant. Um, it would be good, as uh, from a scientific point of view, to have um, information about these uh, black boxes, as David calls them. And um, so what we did, we did a large screening of published data uh, where some of the parameters are maybe published here and there. Uh, from clinical results and uh, preclinical data on animals or on cell lines. And so we try to select the broadest range possible compatibly with the fact that, as Xenia said, we have limited resources. So um, if this answers your question, that's how we proceeded. I'm going to drill a little bit further because why not including monophasic pulses? Because in the literature, they have been using monophasic pulses. And actually, it's shown that it's much more efficient. So you need lower voltages and all the work that has been done, uh, let me say, before 2019 was basically with the monophasic pulses. I'm so <laughs> Go ahead. Maura first, Xenia second. Xenia, go ahead. No, no, it's OK. Xenia first. OK. Xenia first, so Maura second. I didn't like monophasic pulses. You didn't like monophasic Not we, cells. We love cells. Monophasic. <laughs> but isn't the point of cells being don't, not liking the, the pulses? <laughs> well, they're not biphasic. They just... I mean, we're killing the cells. <laughs> we're killing the cells. It's... We were looking at reversible electric operation a lot in the beginning as well, so we're not okay. always killing them. Um, it's really sort of a balance between it's, what we uh, uh, Again, I'm going to drill a little bit more. I mean, I, we've been working for 30 years in, in reversible electric operation, and we were all using, for gene transfer and for chemotherapy delivery, monophasic pulses. So, you know, it's the cells do survive, and they do like monophasic pulses. 
if, if you use the same terminology. <laughs> yeah, when I came to FDA, my first consult was on nano knife, and this is monophasic thing. And I tried it on our cardiac ah, Okay, that explains the 0 0.2 uh, uh, microsecond uh, lower bound, uh, I would say. <laughs> Good. Uh, another question, comment? Not, I would like to now invite uh, uh, Rafael Davalos, uh, uh, why and how cells are dying? I think this is actually almost direct answer to the question which I read from the chat channel. Thanks, the floor is yours. Well, uh, th thank you for having me. I'll talk to you a little bit about, I think the cell death mechanisms, I think it's gonna be, this is an area still of ongoing research is what I'd like to say. Um, I do think one of the big things why um, pulse field ablation is just so much more attractive than microwave ablation or any of these other thermal ablation techniques is, um, you know, you really, it's just so much more safe. And I think that's why, um, why people started gaining some traction. There are two big things, I think, and the first was uh, Boris Ravinsky showing that you could, you know, not thermally damage critical structures such as the esophagus and then, than us moving to a, a more biphasic pulse waveform. Um, but, you know, the fact that you have these different types of cell death mechanisms from expiration have been known for decades. This has been studied originally for like, uh, electrical injuries. A lot of this was done by uh, Rafael Lee in Chicago. Um, some, some great pioneering work in there that indeed showed that depending on the pulse width and pulse strength, um, you can get uh, non-thermal or thermal type cell death. Um, and this is a nice review article, I think, uh, um, showing that depending on the, you know, the, the pulse parameters that are being chosen, you're going to have um, you can get a reversible expiration with the cells recover, which most people were, were looking at it in, in this way for, in our field, um, but based on calcium overload and, and ATP leakage and that, and that um, calcium ATP interaction, maybe you could get to something more apoptotic or in the cloud. So, so, so those are... Um, kind of the things that are going on here. I think um, a little while ago now, we published a paper showing that uh, moving to this biphasic waveform, we have a positive polarity, some kind of uh, delay and a negative polarity and another delay, um, might have some clinical advantages such as um, more predictable lesion volumes, uh, more predictable ablations and mitigating that muscle contraction. At that time, um, it was relatively unexplored. So this was a nice review article by Jim Weaver at MIT, so that you get more necrosis type cell death. People were thinking at the longer pulse scales, at the nanosecond pulse fields, more apoptotic like cell death. But this area, up until you know now, I think has been relatively unexplored. Um, here's a, a, an initial study. I, I have some other studies that people can look at for reference later, but uh, I'll highlight this one real quick to show you. And for a traditional monophasic IRE pulse, it might take uh, you know 1,100 pulse per centimeter to kill those cells. For an H fire pulse or a biphasic kind of pulse field of type pulse, you use a, a 252, so the same energy delivered, and then you're going to need uh, three times that, more than three times that field, so 3,800 pulse per centimeter. What's interesting is that the membrane actually recovers pretty quickly. So even though we're delivering 3,800 pulse per centimeter, um, these are cancer cells, so they're going to be different than your cardiac cells. Um, you can see that, uh, that these cells are going to die, but the membrane did reseal. So um, it just takes time for those cell types um, to die, depending on that waveform that you used. And here we can see if we're looking for different types of pathway cell death mechanisms for the IRE pulse, we actually show that... Um, we, we looked for at caspase 37, which is kind of indicative of um, um, apoptosis. We showed that we didn't see much apoptosis with the IRE cell death, but with the H fire pulse waveform, we saw it at six hours. So, we, so that's something I think that's important for people to know that are interested in those cell death mechanisms. That it's important to know when to look um, for these things. So, for certain cell death mechanisms, you have to look at different. This is a, a nice paper published from Mike Sano from my lab showing some of these delayed cell death mechanisms with H5 waveforms from a while ago. Um, and then a, a recent study from um, Dr. McLeod's group showing different uh, H5 type waveforms and kind of trying to get a, a handle on these um, different cell death mechanisms. Could, could these be used for 
you can serve for controlling them and moving those costs and such. Um, now, I just had those up for reference. Um, the key thing is there's multiple modes of cell death. There's paroptosis, clitosis, apoptosis, and um, necroptosis. I think for the most part, the longer the pulses, you see more necrotic and, and then the shorter. It's apoptotic, but then there's a gray area because when you're applying that field, that field is dissipated. So with the tissue, so you might have more necrotic type cell death near the electrode, and then it might dissipate and be more apoptotic beyond. And, and, and we've seen that in those hydrogel studies that we studied, that, that we see immediate cell death right after we do our staining, and then a delayed cell death mechanism. And then I just wanted to point people to um, um, these nice review articles if they have some interest in looking at the cell Thank you very much. So uh, there's a, there was a question which I think uh, goes a little bit to Maura and uh, a little bit to, to you as well. I mean, uh, the, the question goes in, in, vi in vivo, the, you see reversible electroporation. And so the question is, can you address now the same phenomena of the reversibility or in, in, in vitro as well? So I don't know exactly how and, and why, but probably it, it has to do, the question has to do with how you can uh, determine the dynamics or, or how, how to determine when, you know, and how the cells would die. That, that would be my understanding. Yeah, I'm not... If I got the more, I can jump in here. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, it's yeah. probably for both a little bit. One big thing that people have to remember is, I, I think that in vitro and ex vivo studies give you a lot of insight, but you're, you're kind of studying the cell on its own. Right? There's no means, there's no other repair mechanisms that are helping out. So, um, but I do think that the future studies and ex vivo studies and such can give you trends and kind of give you a sense of you know, how things should change if you turn this knob or that knob, as alluded to before, there's so many knobs when you're delivering these uh, these types of waveforms that you could try. So getting, uh, before you jump into the animal studies, getting a sense of what's happening in vitro, I think you can gain a lot of insight before you do your animal studies as well. Okay. Thanks. Maura, you want to, to add yeah. to this? Yes. Just a second. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Damiana. I think uh, I completely in line with what Rafael was saying, use these uh, tools as a mean to understanding uh, qualitative trends uh, when changing one, tuning one parameter or the other. In our first publication with in vitro models, we were able to quantify cell recovery as well. Uh, in our studies, we do not go into the me mechanisms of effect. We just quantify um, reversible versus irreversible electroporation. And what we notice in um, in uh, with our assay is that uh, the there was little if non reversibility. So, like I think ninety percent of the cell died, uh, and only a minor percentage survived. Um, however, at the time we were using a, um, a limited range of pulses, so we didn't have um, enough variation in the pulse uh, ranges to say, okay, if we use microsegons versus nanosegons, or if you use these pulse repetition frequency versus that pulse repetition frequency, you are expected to see more or less recovery, if this makes sense. Tina, go ahead. Uh, so wearing my FDA hat, right, and thinking about safety and effectiveness of medical devices, why would I, what's the main reason I should care what the mechanism of cell death we see? You know, we started as no thermal, now, you know, maybe it's thermal in the middle of the lesion. Do I really care? Is it because of an immune response or anything? Well, okay, so, so there's a couple of questions. So first, with yeah. that reversibility, I do think, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier in my um, that the number of pulses that you could deliver is going to make it harder and harder for a cell to recover. So it does depend on the pulse parameters. I think it depends on your application. So um, for cardiac ablation, where you don't want to, it's not so much if you thermally damage certain cells, it's, it's which cells you're thermally damaging, right? So you want to make sure you're not thermally damaging the esophagus, right? So you want to make sure that the energy being input, being inputted into the system isn't damaging those critical structures. So it, it depends if you're doing 
let's say cancer therapy, which is sort of more what I I work in there. Um, If you're thermally damaging the inside of the tumor, you know, that might not matter. Maybe it hurts your immune response a little bit. Um, But then the big thing is not damaging those critical structures that you're trying to protect. So so it kind of, um, it depends on the application and depends in kind of considering what areas you're trying to protect from traditional thermal damage. Timeline is also very important, right? When to look for reversibility. Can you speak up, please? Can you speak up? He hears me. <laughs> I know, but we need to hear you as well. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was just bringing point. Uh, cell mechanism is probably important when you look at the timeline, right? If you know the some some specific mechanism appears earlier than others, so if you look at the safety and how the study should be designed, right? You should want to make sure that you're looking at the right time, right? Okay. So it stirs me up a little bit when somebody says, do we need to know why the cells are dying? Do you care about that? But I don't want to enter in this debate because it, I think we need to move a little bit further. Uh, uh, I just, uh, for the for for the dimension, yes. I do. Even though you were saying it stirs you up, it actually stirs me up as a clinician. As well, yeah. Because I think we have to know exactly how and why the cells are dying, you know, and over what time frame. And, you know, our, our very simplistic cardiology hats have been, it's apoptosis. As long as it, there's, there's only two modes of cell death, apoptosis and necrosis, that's it. And, you know, Raphael, when I was looking at your talk earlier, you know, and you were going through all these different, different modes of cell death and how it can change immune responses and, you know, bacterial loads and other things like that. Like, we we have to understand those basic things and understand that when we're doing PFA in the heart, it is not purely non-thermal apoptotic cell death. There's actually a mixture of different things going on. And to compare the different therapies, I would want to know as a clinician, what's the mixture? So, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail okay. later. But Thank it's you. an important uh, issue. Uh, I would uh, like to put the dimension on, on, the, on the amount of people that is uh, right now on, online. We have 157 people that have connected. So it's a little bit bigger group than we are here. So just so that you are aware. Uh, now, uh, allow me in the interest of time to move on, and we're going to probably come back to the immune response, uh, whether it's relevant or not, should we care about it or not, and, and so on. So the next uh, presenter is Samo, Samo Maknic Kolomisa from University of Ljubljana. So Samo, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Samo. Uh, so my task for today is to address the question, uh, is there a safety risk uh, to patients uh, posed by PFA? from the perspective of microbubbles. So why bother with this? Why study bubbles in uh, post vibration at all? Well, because in RFA and in uh, historically during development of PFA in intracardial DC discharges, there was um, some gas bubble production and coagulum formation observed. And these bubbles and coagula can travel uh, throughout the body, uh, ending up in various organs, uh, where they can lead to an embolism, potentially. Uh, if this happens in the brain, this can lead to a stroke or uh, the appearance of so-called uh, silent cerebral lesions, uh, whose clinical uh, relevance remains to be fully elucidated. Uh, there is not a clear consensus on how uh, relevant uh, these are. Uh, and most, if not all, human contemporary PFA systems uh, do produce uh, some uh, bubbles as observed by intracardiac echography. Now, uh, why is this important? Um, well, because if we're trying to uh, ramp up and move into producing ventricular lesions, uh, we need to uh, increase the amplitude, to increase the number of pulses, to increase the number of trains, uh, to increase the treatment intensity. And there is a, a potential a risk of increasing also the bubble count and volume by doing so. Um, so, uh, how to mitigate this? Well, in order to approach this uh, problem, we need to first understand where the bubbles are originating from. Uh, and we can broadly identify three mechanisms. So, electrochemistry, uh, if we produce bubbles through uh, 
hydrolysis, so electrolysis of water, uh, the medium. Uh, then we have gasification of gases that are already dissolved uh, in, the, in the medium that uh, will gasify at the elevated temperature, uh, at elevated temperatures or due to, for instance, cavitation. Uh, and then we have just purely thermal boiling of the solvent. Uh, if you reach uh, the temperatures uh, sufficient for uh, reaching the boiling point of water. Um, now, uh, depending on what mechanism uh, the bubbles originate by, we have different uh, species of gas in the bubbles. And because we have different physics of generation of these bubbles, we also have different physics of their annihilation. And this different physics of annihilation leads to the fact that the longevity of these bubbles will be different. Uh, for instance, when bubbles are electrochemically generated or when uh, they're generated by degasification of the liquid uh, by thermal means, uh, these bubbles tend to be long-lived. Uh, whereas if you have just boiling of the solvent, uh, these uh, tend to um, transition back into the liquid phase almost immediately when you stop delivery of the energy to the system. Uh, this is direct your attention maybe to the right uh, video where you see almost absolutely nothing uh, with biphasic pulse delivery. This is just an illustration, uh, an experiment done with normal saline uh, to demonstrate how uh, differently, uh, how, 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 what a huge difference there is uh, in biphasic versus monophasic pulse delivery in terms of bubble mm -hmm. production, because these are, of course, mostly um, generated uh, electrochemically in the case of uh, monophasic pulses. And in the case of biphasic pulses, we could observe practically nothing. But this is a relatively generous geometry in the sense of temperature, because this, these electrodes are quite far apart. They have a large surface area. Um, and we wanted to see, can we uh, reproduce the bubbles that are seen in intracardiac echography? So we designed, a, a, designed an experiment where we took half normal saline in a beaker and uh, a mo modified RFA catheter uh, and the fast camera. So the, the RFA catheter was modified such that the, its tip was of one polarity and all the segments that are further down mm -hmm. the neck of the catheter were wired together and of the other polarity. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, recorded videos with a high-speed camera. So this maybe it's not very easy to see, but uh, because the video is very dark due to low exposure, but this is monophasic pulse delivery using this catheter. So it's uh, 100 microseconds followed by 100 microsecond pause. So the duty cycle is quite high. And what you see is that there are, there's boiling uh, at the electrode edges where the uh, current density is highest. And when the pulse delivery is over, this water vapor that appears immediately implodes causing an implosion that forces these bubbles that were otherwise electrochemically generated together, and they coalesce into larger bubbles, and they are blown away from the electrode surface. Uh, contrast this with a typical H5 protocol, so typical protocol that um, Rafael was mentioning earlier. Uh, this is a quite a high duty cycle, so we have just a two microsecond pause in between each consecutive uh, biphasic pulse, and there is boiling again at the electrode edges. But all the bubbles that were the bubbles that are produced are clearly boiling because they immediately uh, mm -hmm. collapse back into the liquid phase once delivery is over. So this was uh, this is uh, can be also shown to be a true numerical simulation that the uh, temperature near the electrode edges is indeed close to the boiling point of water. Uh, now, how to mitigate this? Well, we can take a larger, uh, longer pause between uh, two consecutive pulses. We'll get a much lower duty cycle, <coughs> in this case, with much lower power. So the same energy will be delivered over a longer period of time. And there's no, practically no bubble formation, and there's definitely no boiling. Um, so it's all down to the protocol in this case. So in conclusion, there's practically no discussion H5 versus monophasic. Uh, it's, it's clear because of the actual chemistry. But also in biphasic delivery, we have to be careful of some aspects. So uh, the protocol has to be designed such that uh, it's uh, not uh, causing uh, boiling of, of the medium, of course, or excessive heating that would lead to degasification of the medium. And we have to pay attention to the applicator and uh, or the geometry of the electrodes to avoid hot spots. 
But also keep in mind that everything I was showing in my presentation was done in half normal or normal saline, and blood is not saline. More complicated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Salon. So uh, now I know we are mainly when when I talk with with, with people using uh, uh, PFA, uh, mainly they are not concerned with the few bubbles that they see. But of course, the general strategy when you need to achieve deeper lesion, transmural lesion, is actually. Increase the amplitude, increase the duration, increase the number of pulses or the trains of pulses. Or so, what we do, we 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 are dialing up. And I think what the, what the, the the general message here is: if we know where the the bubbles are coming from, then we can probably uh, avoid the the let me say at least the the worst scenario. So that's that's what I've been seeing over and over again, you know, do I want to achieve an additional millimeter of, of lesion? Yes, how can I do it? Well, I'll go a little bit higher. In what? Without, in whatever I can, yeah, basically. So I think that's, uh, that's uh, uh, an important consideration. Uh, Eberhard. A short comment in Physical chemistry, there's an analytical method in producing electrically ultrasound waves. So mm -hmm. the two electrodes are charged, so to say. They contract and produce a sound wave. And this sound wave produces bubbles. I wonder to which extent this can be included. So depends yep. on the device of the electrodes. Thanks. I would uh, thank you very much, Iberhard. Uh, I would like to actually read the uh, uh, first response from Vivek in, in the chat. A uh, uh, please remember that the microbubble related concern with RF energy was not related to microbubbles themselves, but rather that this was a marker of tissue superheating, so resulting in char, in, in char formation, which does not mean that this will not happen in. In, in the blood in, with PFA, if we have excessive heating, meaning we have boiling, yeah? So I, I don't know if we are happy with that. And of course, the microbubbles, uh, uh, the microbubbles associated with PFA, at least as clinically used, are ubiquitous and, as, and of unknown significance. So uh, while aesthetically pleasing to have less microbubbles, it has been demonstrated that they matter. Good. So they don't matter, or they matter. So we will we will we will, will definitely address that. Now uh, another thing is that data presented at cardiology conferences describe ten to twenty percent cerebral lesion after PFA. Yeah. So that is presented. So whether you know how significant that is, or right now it's judged as insignificant. Uh, I I think it's it's something that. Needs to be addressed or not, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's been a long topic. You know, asymptomatic cerebral embolism has long been a topic. You know, dating back to radio frequency and multipolar radio frequency, and so there are you know historical benchmarks uh, for MRI studies. I think that's a part of the clinical evaluation process that's that's ongoing with these technologies. So, you know, more to come under under that. Okay, I too. Yeah, I, I think uh, just two comments on that. I think, um, yeah, right now PFA is being considered to be in a, what we call an acceptable range of ACE lesions. That doesn't mean we can't improve on that. Um, and the other thing, just uh, I was, your presentation was excellent, but I think to to take home the message that bipolar generally is better than monopolar for bubble formation depends entirely, as you said, on the geometry of the electrodes. And uh, because certainly clinically, what I've seen having used both monopolar and bipolar systems is that uh, if anything, the, the bipolars are actually creating far more 
larger numbers of these micro bubbles uh, on on ice rather than the monopolar systems. And I think it's just related to electrode size, proximity, geometry. Uh, so I, I just want to be careful or cautious to say that bipolar is always going to be safer than monopolar because actually in the clinical situation, we've seen yeah. the opposite. Uh, yeah, I actually should clarify this. Uh, maybe there's a bit of confusion going, with, going on with the with the two terms, bipolar and biphasic. So, by um, what Simon was talking about with uh, bi uh, was biphasic versus monophasic, and that in, in the same ge geometry as we've seen in the video, obviously the biphasic one is clearly favorable. The other discussion is where is the, you have the bipolar convectoring. On, and you have delivering on two, two different electrodes on the same catheter, and that the, the high-speed camera was uh, in the in the experiments was a bipolar configuration. So it was it was interesting, but nevertheless, you know that's not to say that the bi bipolar will always be worse or always be better. That is still, as you said, clearly down to the electrode configuration. Yeah. And uh, there, there is one question in the chat. Uh, it's just yes and no answer, and, and then we'll move on. Uh, did you see arcing during the experiment? Yes. Yes. So the answer is yes. But of course, that entirely depends on the geometry and the pulses and the amplitudes and so on. So. What about the monophasic? If that's okay, the next, uh, the next question, mm -hmm. Raphael, maybe you can speak oh. out. I was going to ask, was that the arcing only with the mono? We've done similar experiments, so I was going to ask if it was only with the mono, only with yeah. the mono phase. Okay, I, th I think the, the discussion is interesting for everybody. I just wanted to yeah. you to speak up. Okay, so the next question is actually already going into the electrical stimulation, the nerve muscle, and so on. So I would actually like to uh, uh, invite now uh, Tony. Uh, uh, Anthony Vora from uh, uh, University Pompeo Fabre, uh, Fabra from uh, Barcelona uh, to uh, present uh, uh, your view and your topic. Thank you very much, I mean, Thank you for organizing this. I think it's very, it's very interesting. So what I'm going to talk basically it's about some effects that we have uh, during BFA that are somehow related to the nervous system, or so we think are related somehow to the nervous system. So the first thing that just everybody is aware here, when we are delivering pulses for performing electro, electro operation, sorry, EFA, we are most likely going to cause electrical stimulation. And the reason for that is basically in both cases, in both phenomena, basically what we want to do is to change the transmembrane voltage. So that's the what initiates both phenomena. And the fact is that the thresholds for electro operation typically are higher than the transmembrane voltage uh, thresholds are typically higher than the transmembrane voltage thresholds that we need for uh, electrical stimulation. So basically, it is very difficult to achieve electroporation without inducing some sort of uh, electrical stimulation, so meaning creating action potentials. And this is very clear in the case of neuromuscular stimulation. And fortunately, what uh, it has been known, and uh, to a large extent thanks to Rafael Davalos, is that with biphasic waveforms of high frequency, we minimize a lot um, electrical stimulation, at, this, at least when we are talking about neuromuscle stimulation. And with bipolar setups that reduce, confine the electric field, this, uh, this is even improved, it's further improved. There is um, the reason why um, uh, electroporic, so why high frequency biphasic waveforms help in that sense is, is not obvious because actually, uh, both phenomena are expected, so electroporation and uh, stimulation, are expected to decrease when we increase the frequency. The thing is that it appears that uh, with frequency, uh, electroporation, let's say the threshold for electroporation are more or less constant, and the threshold for achieving uh, electrical stimulation is step. So it's becoming harder and harder to stimulate. Uh, tomorrow I will present a little bit about uh, why this is. I mean, uh, Rafael already presented this study, not going into the why we believe this is this is happening, but the thing is that at the end the outcome is that when we use high frequency waveforms, what we are is reducing the area as he explained before in the in the school. Well, what we are doing is reducing the area where we can stimulate nearby nerves. So basically, we can have electrical stimulation, but if we 
um, increase the frequency of the biphasic waveforms, we can still do electroporation, but we minimize the chance of stimulating a nearby nerve. And that's basically what explains why high frequencies are interesting. So something related to, uh, to the nervous system is the fact that a very interesting thing with irreversible electroporation, well, with electroporation in general, is that uh, we don't cause permanent damage to nerves. And, and this, is, this is interesting. I mean, it has been tried to apply even very high fields. And if we don't get to permanent damage because of thermal issues, we don't damage the nerve in a permanent way. And that's, there are a number of papers on that. I'm not going to go into the details. And of course, this is linked to the observation that there is some effects on the phrenic nerve in the case of PFA. So what we have been observed in PFA and in electroporation in general, in the use of reversible electroporation and irreversible electroporation, is that while we don't damage the nerve, it's true that for a short period of time, not so short period of time in the case of uh, irreversible electroporation, the nerve is not, let's say, working anymore. And uh, this can range from minutes in the case of, of, of PFA, and we are probably going to hear about that. And we can even go into weeks uh, for the case where we are applying a very extreme, uh, let's say, protocol close to a nerve intentionally for causing irreversible electroporation. In the case of this recovery that we see of the function in the case of the weeks, probably what we have is regeneration. So basically, we think we are damaging the axons, but because we are preserving all the accessory architecture, the nerves regenerate, the axons regenerate through all the structures of the nerve. Thing. And what probably most likely is happening in the case of this transient, uh, let's say, arrest of the nerve function, it's uh, basically that we, when we do electroporation, so when we apply PFA, we increase the permeability of the axons, the, so the axons become, uh, the brain becomes conductive, and we know, models tell us, and, and experimental, we know that if the uh, membrane conductivity increases, we are not going to have action potentials going through there. At, at, uh, initially, what we are going to have is uh, the potentials is slightly disturbed in terms of the shape. We are also going to reduce the propagation of these action potentials, and eventually we are going to arrest them. What probably is happening is that we have a sort of reversible electroporation, so that after minutes, these, uh, let's say, axons reseal, and then we have, again, the propagation. That's most likely what is happening. In the, any case, it's interesting to note that we don't have permanent damage. So something, uh, something unrelated and which is, uh, let's say, an aspect of concern is the vascular spasm, the coronary uh, spasm that has been observed for a long time uh, with epicardial setups, uh, uh, also for with endo, endocardial setups, and even with the studies in which it has been studied the dose of the PFA to see how this changes the, the lumen, so the diameter of the, of the vessel. It has been observed that, yeah, there is, a, there is a, an spasm of the, of the vessel. And this is um, kind of, uh, and it's still not understood in, in, the, in, in the field of PFA, let's say, but uh, we have something in the field of electroporation that has been uh, known for, for long, and which uh, was labeled by Vismir and, and Julie Gill uh, as the vascular lock phenomenon, which basically is the observation that when we do electroporation in a tissue, for a while, we don't have a blood flow there. And this is, uh, actually, there are two uh, stages. It has been that there are two phases. And the first phase, which is very similar to what we observed, what I understand it's observed in the case of PFA with the um, coronary spasm, is the, uh, the first step, it seems to be related with a response of the sympathetic system. The more accurate, let's say, explanation probably is found in, the, in this uh, paper here from from Ljubljana, in which basically the two, uh, this is a review paper in which basically we are talking about tumors, but basically the phenomenon we believe is the same. Basically, this first stage is a stage that is very rapid, and it's attributed to the fact that uh, basically we are doing electroporation, so we electroporate everything, and among other things, we electroporate the blood vessel wall. And most likely what it happens is that there is a release of some, uh, let's say, markers for, for, for injury. And this is what at the end causes the sympathetic response contracting the, the, blood, the blood vessel. So that's likely, if that's the case, one possible solution, and this is kind of an idea I'm throwing here, 
it would be to minimize electroporation in the blood vessel. And this is something that uh, can be done, or we can think about doing, by modifying the conductivity of the blood vessel. So if we perfuse for a short time while we are doing the treatment a liquid, a fluid of lower conductivity, we will uh, basically avoid to a large extent the possibility of electroporating the wall of the, of the, of the, of the vessel. And that's basically because the vessel, uh, the blood is highly conductive, so it acts, let's say, from the electric form point of view, it acts like a sort of lens in the sense that it focuses the electric field. So around the, the blood vessel, we are going to have hot spots in terms of the electric field. Uh, on the other hand, we are going to have spots that don't have any electric field. This is something that uh, we developed uh, in many years ago, and this idea for the field of, of tumor treatments. In the, that case, what we wanted is to be sure that the uh, tumors around the vessels, let's say, were completely uh, electroporated. In this case, it would be a possible solution. I don't know. This is an idea to discuss. And then this is a topic I have to admit I have little knowledge, uh, the, the topic of coughing. So it has been observed in a number of reports, so a number of studies have reported that coughing appears during the, the delivery of the of the treatment, actually even a little bit after. So it's not, it seems that coughing is not related to stimulation. So it's not like we are stimulating the the diaphragm, uh, the fraying nerve, and that stimulates the diaphragm, or that we are stimulating the afferent nerves that induce the reflex act of coughing. It seems that somehow we are causing an effect, I don't know, some kind of irritation that uh, makes uh, the this uh, um, reaction, this reflex, to be executed. And with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thanks. So this was actually a direct response to one of the questions, is stimulation with biphasic pulses uh, less than with the monophasic pulses? And yes, the biphasic actually do uh, 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 require higher voltages, higher amplitude to achieve the stimulation of the nervous uh, uh, muscular system. So any discussion on this point? I mean, Everhart, go ahead. Just a short comment. Please remember that in the electrophysiological situation, the resting potential of the nerve is basically covered by firm selective potassium gradient. And you have to reduce this gradient by 20 millivolt about in order to activate the sodium system, which is opposite. And this is a real threshold, whereas the threshold in electroporation and so on is a visibility threshold. Depends on the sensitivity you can measure operation. So if the sensitivity is very low, then the threshold is higher. So I think uh, for devising uh, uh, devising uh, electrodes and systems, this one has really to consider. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, not damaging nerves, uh, what you mentioned, it's, uh, I, I remember a long time ago in our lab, we were working on nerve regeneration, uh, stimulating by direct currents. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we did was actually we were causing axonotmesis. This is what I think is the right word, where you just pinch for some time the nerve. We were working on ischiaticus, and of course you damage the, the, the nerve, but all the structure, uh, the fascia and so on stays there. So that enables the recovery. So even if we do not have immediate resolution of the of the palsy, uh, I think there were there were a couple of cases uh, published or at least uh, discussed uh, uh, in in conferences recently that for a couple after a couple of months there was a recovery of, of yeah. the nerve. Yeah. Exactly. One of those papers basically is one, uh, eight weeks after they exactly. recover. Yeah. So it's a long time. I mean, there, there, there is a range of, of recovery time. Yeah. That, that's the most spectacular one because they actually applied like uh, 3,000 volts directly into the net. So that was mm. extreme. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, why don't we move on? And I'm sure we're going to come back uh, with uh, some more. So uh, Atul Verma from McGill, uh, uh, Montreal, Canada. The tool, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, so thank you uh, very much, uh, Damien. Uh, this is a very interesting conference, and it's nice to hear from people who have been working on this for a long time, whereas the cardiologists uh, just sort of stepped in only a very, very short time ago, so we, we don't really know that much about this. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to skip over this fairly quickly, but the idea was that thermal ablation has really been our standard for 25 years. It works. It works very well. We've treated hundreds of thousands of patients with this. Uh, however, uh, the risk of collateral damage remains. Uh, cardiac tamponade may be mechanical, so PFA won't necessarily get rid of that, although if you have steam pops or, or thermal damage to the tissue, this is a mechanism for tamponade as well. Esophageal injury is a big deal. I mean, the risk of this is very small. It's probably less than one in a thousand, but the reality is that if it occurs, it's fatal. And for a procedure that is basically an elective procedure, a fatal outcome is unacceptable. And, you know, uh, anyone who has had a patient go through this, uh, I can tell you it's, it's a devastating event. So if the only thing that PFA delivers is esophageal safety, uh, that's enough for me. Uh, phrenic nerve injury, I mean, it was really more cryo-balloon, cryoablation for those of us who have done years of radiofrequency, where we ablate, we, we, it's almost 0% that you get phrenic nerve injury. Um, so, you know, we want a technique that produces consistent transmural results. We want something that's safe and we want something that's fast and efficient. And the question really has been, can pulse field ablation do this job? And when it was first presented, everyone immediately said yes, yes, and yes. This is going to be a winner, and every single company got into this business. And uh, the speculation amongst clinicians and companies was incredible. However, uh, hopefully we're starting to uh, get smarter about this. And there are obviously going to be some trade-offs. So, yes, we can use these large, I put in quotation marks, single-shot catheters. None of them are really single-shot, but we'll call it that, which have a bipolar setup. And, yes, you can get rapid PV isolation. Yes, you can rapidly do the posterior wall. But the trade-off is that you're going to have a lower tissue depth so the question of durability of lesions and the lack of flexibility in lesions. So, you know, you're stuck doing the veins or the posterior wall, and if you want to do something else, well, too bad. Uh, then you have the point-by-point -point catheters, which are more of a monopolar setup, still with biphasic waves, but monopolar. It may be a little less time efficient, but you may be getting deeper lesions on average and maybe more durable and you have more flexibility in terms of what you want to do. And then of course there's the integration with mapping. Is this important or not? Some of the people who've used the early generation PFA without mapping in Europe say, oh, I don't need mapping anymore. Uh, I think that's a transient thing and at the end of the day mapping is important. It's become critical to everything that we do. And so even though there may be some excitement and interest now about not mapping, I think in the long run, mapping is, is going to be absolutely critical. So uh, do we actually, does the data actually support better safety, better efficiency, and better efficacy? So in terms of safety, so far, most of the studies, this is just one example of one study, but... The, if you put together all of the safety data from the post-market registries, the clinical trials, it's been looking very, very promising. I mean, if anyone had told me you could get less than a 1% safety adverse event rate for a new technology that most operators had never used, 
I mean, I would have said no way. And the, the reality is a few of these trials have been giving us numbers like this. Of course, we can't say anything about the esophagus because the rate of esophageal uh, critical injury is very, very low. But the fact that we're not seeing phrenic nerve, the fact that we're not seeing pulmonary vein stenosis, the fact that the other uh, stroke and, and, you know, silent stroke rates are not that bad. It's, it's pretty impressive. But what are some ongoing issues? So all of the systems are saying they've dealt with the issue of musculoskeletal recruitment. Having now used almost every system, maybe minus one, uh, I can tell you that the musculoskeletal recruitment has not been dealt with completely. Uh, there are some systems where there is definitely musculoskeletal recruitment. They, they call it phrenic recruitment. It's not phrenic recruitment, it's MSK recruitment. And I think even though uh, a lot of people are saying we can get away with sedation, uh, the reality is it's, it's much more comfortable for the patient and for the operator, quite frankly, especially if you're using mapping to have GA or intra-procedural paralytics. And now there's some talk about myoglobin release into the urine. And what I'll say is you cannot release enough myoglobin from the heart to cause kidney damage. Because if you were, the whole heart would be destroyed. Okay, So obviously this is coming from skeletal muscle. So let's, let's not pretend that there's no MSK recruitment. The profound vagal response is causing asystole. I mean, we can deal with it with pretreatment with atropine, but they are profound and uh, is probably just more of a vagal reflex. I think the coughing, as some people say, well, coughing is not a big deal. It's probably stimulation of the J receptors in the pulmonary veins. Because when we used to ablate inside the pulmonary veins with thermal energy, we would see coughing all the time. Uh, so this is, I think it's just the fact that the field is extending into the PVs. And if there, there are lots of basic scientists in here who are much smarter than me. And, and you know, if you can look at this J receptor reflex, I think it's, it's important. And people say, well, coughing, who cares? Well, actually, if you cough against a ventilator, a positive pressure ventilator, when the patient is intubated, that can actually cause barotrauma. And these patients are anticoagulated, so it can actually cause pulmonary hemorrhage. So it's, actually, it's a big deal. And, and paralytics do not eliminate this J receptor reflex. So the patients still cough when they're paralyzed. And then finally, the large device sizes and the potential for intracardiac damage. I mean, I think we need to figure out what the ideal uh, device size and device configuration is in order to avoid that. Uh, one small thing I'll also say about uh, cerebral safety. I mean, there are differences amongst the systems in terms of how much microbubble formation is occurring. Um, and for the esophagus as well, I didn't put it up there, but the different systems are creating more incidental esophage esophageal heating than others. So some of the systems, uh, I've been routinely putting a probe in. It's a very crude measure. I mean, this is hardly science at its hard, highest level, but you know, we, we see some systems where we get 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degree rises in the esophageal temperature, others where we see, you know, one degree, and some that are causing even two degree rises, which is similar to what we see with thermal ablation. So clearly, all of the systems are right at that thermal edge, and some are crossing that thermal edge. Otherwise, you can't create a two degree rise in the lumen of the esophagus. Uh, efficiency, there's no doubt about it. Uh, this is data from the real world experience in Europe. Procedure times are getting down to 39 minutes. Uh, when I started, uh, procedure time was four hours. So uh, this is unheard of. I still can't believe it, but it's, it's true. But efficacy wise, I think what we're seeing is that the tissue depth of the bipolar biphasic systems 
is very similar to what we were getting with radiofrequency and cryoablation. And that's why we're seeing results like this, where the efficacy is, is going to be the same. So it's no worse than thermal, but it's also no better than thermal, at least today. Uh, you know, this will probably change over time, but depth matters. Uh, and, you know, if you're getting three to four millimeters of tissue depth, A, this is not going to be better than thermal, and B, it's not going to suffice for ventricular ablation. So these systems are not necessarily going to just be able to go uh, directly into the ventricle. So I'll wrap up there, but, uh, you know, those are sort of my current observations at the present day. I know Vivek is going to be talking about future-looking things, so I didn't want to uh, go there. Thanks. And I, I think Vivek will also address uh, uh, the, the, the recent uh, 17,000 plus experience. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, even more important than looking at the future right now. I, I appreciate very much, uh, I mean, your, your uh, uh, experience and sharing with us. And the, the fact that we are looking, I mean, that you can see a two centigrade increase in esophagus. Uh, I was, the, the first time I was actually uh, 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 presenting the, the, my views of, or my understanding of electroporation to uh, electrophysiologists in, in, at the AAF symposium, I was trying to convey the message that uh, this is not inherently non-thermal uh, uh, method. So, you know, when we are dialing up and when we are uh, delivering a number of pulses, obviously depending on the duty cycle and all of that, we will heat up the tissue. To, to what extent, of course, two degrees, it's, it's, it's not, I would say, damaging, but that's two degrees deep into the esophagus, yeah? and your catheter is uh, uh, at a distance. So probably the, the degrees close to the catheter must be higher than that. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, yeah. Add, add a comment. I think there's been a number of questions around, you know, the cough reflex and just, again, speculation, but, you know, epilepsy systems which use cervical vagal stimulation and have an afferent signaling to the brain induce cough. And I think that maybe goes with the, the J receptor theory is that you're somehow stimulating autonomic response, stimulate an afferent afro response, with that, which then uh, results in some level of perhaps cough. And again, it's completely speculative, relatively limited uh, data, unless somebody's got some that they'll share. I uh, know it'd be wonderful for yeah. one of the basic scientists to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that pair in paired fibers, but they, they're, in fact, it's mostly they, the, most of the vagus nerve after and the efferent fibers uh, that turn on the vagus nerve the vagus. And they have to enter the, the mediastinum <coughs> at the, the point of the, the large vessels. So if you actually take just a pacing catheter and you stimulate along the inside of the pulmonary arteries, you'll see sympathetic and parasympathetic expansion, including coffee okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, a tool, uh, you highlighted the importance of mapping. Uh, uh, in, in previous presentation by Ivora, I'm, I'm reading now a, a, a comment question, suggested that it could induce temporary absence of action potential in excitable cells, considering cardiomyocytes are excitable too. Won't this imply that cardiac <clears throat> mapping might reveal unresponsive areas that could later recover? Consequently, treatment might be suboptimal due to potential false positive. How do you propose addressing this issue? I think this is a, an observation that now is uh, uh, becoming obvious and clear. Yeah, so I, I think, so first of all, there's a lot of reasons why we do mapping, right? So first of all, is just basically anatomical reconstruction. Forget about the electrical information. So I think that's important. But then the pre-ablation information can be very important. So especially when we're dealing with some of these persistent AF patients, we need to understand the mechanism 
Our mapping tools are pretty crude right now, but they're improving all the time. And I believe that mapping will give us important information, especially if we're going to start to move down to the ventricle. Mapping is critical uh, to understand the circuits and everything like that. So even if we lose the bipolar electrogram very quickly, uh, you know, the pre-ablation information is still very important. And then although uh, the bipolar electrogram may be useless, you know, uh, Anthony, uh, Anthony's group and uh, some other work, uh, you know, has been showing that the unipolar electrogram uh, may be very, very important. And so we may lose some of our electrical information, but we may actually be gaining on other yeah. forms of electrical information that we now have to integrate into our yeah. procedures. But it is absolutely true that silencing the, the, the electrograms with the first delivery of the pulses does not coincide with the ablation, yeah? right. like, like this was the case in RFA and, and, and cryo. So that is the big difference. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh we move on to understanding of the PFA. Uh, Daniel? Sure. Daniel Sieg from Metronic, please. Yeah, uh, Damian thank, and team, thanks for having me. It's great, great to be here, great to talk about those topics, all near and dear to my heart as well. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit uh, basic. These are my disclosures, so I can add a fail free card. <laughs> So, so at Metronic, actually, we've started looking at, and this is work by Mark Stewart, Jim Bacong, and others, um, at irreversible electroporation for the heart uh, quite a long time ago. This was actually published in 2009. Um, and I'll show a, a series of slides showing lesions actually at different time points, because I think there are some interesting points to look at here that, you know, and my title sounding grandiose, but really my meaning we're trying to understand PFA. I think we're still at the very beginning. Um, so um, here you see um, on the left-hand side, electroporation. So now we call it pulse field ablation. You, you see some swelling and breakup. And on the right-hand side, RF, it's, it's probably hard to see on that and on the next slide a little bit better. But already we could detect clear differences between RF and electroporation. This is now just acutely after epicardial ablation that was done in a, in a ovine or sheep model. Um, so kind of fast forward, and now we're looking at uh, two weeks. And again, we're looking, we're comparing kind of a gold standard of ablation RF on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side uh, with PF. You can kind of see, you know, already, uh, you know, side by side stark differences. So we have quite a nice homogeneous fibrosis with PFA. We have normal patent vessels, <clears throat> arterioles look normal, uh, no hemorrhage, uh, no uh, epicardial fat in this case is not inflamed as opposed to the left hand side. So again, you know, we're, we don't have all the answers. We talked a lot this morning. We heard about immunology and electroporation. We, we don't fully understand all that and how this may actually translate in clinical differences down the road. Maybe the remodeling processes will be different. We don't know. What we do know is, you know, we will get eventually a nice replacement fibrosis. For our purposes, for cardiac ablation, obviously, we're very interested in irreversible electroporation, so we want to create the scar. And so, you know, this is a more translational study published in 2021, so just recently, just kind of showing the chronic star scar stage at, at four weeks then. So, so this is some of our, you know, understanding of the actual lesions we're creating, you know, in different models. And uh, this is, um, again, in a, in a four-week porcine uh, model. So now, as we're looking at, you know, with cardiac ablation, if you heard Dr. Berman, on others, you know, we're also very concerned with safety, of course, because we're ablating in the heart, which is a very sensitive structure to all of us. And so we want to really make sure we're not creating collateral damage. Um, Natul has mentioned esophageal injury that, you know, we know esophageal fistula is, is catastrophic. Um, 
you know, there's also PV stenosis, maybe not as common these days anymore, but nevertheless, you know, it's also something that can be actually quite severe for a patient if severe enough to cause a cardiac and so in this model, on the left-hand side, we, we specifically looked at PV stenosis in a 12-week animal study, and we tried to really compare RF with PF. We did the lesions very deep in the, in the pulmonary veins and really wanted to see, can we create pulmonary vein stenosis with, with, with either um, ablation modality? And it turns out we couldn't do it with PF, even though we'd actually tried, uh, as opposed to RF. Um, and, and then also, you know, it was already mentioned some of our work that we and others did with the phrenic nerve. So we spent quite a bit of time to really try to understand, you know, the interaction with the phrenic nerve. We, for example, found in this work that we published last year that we could dose dependently stun the phrenic nerve, um, you know, um, as well. So, so that was kind of mentioned. As well. And what's nice about these findings, I'm not showing any clinical data today, but all of this so far has been confirmed in our clinical trials. The two of us briefly talked about that as well. So kind of, it's nice to see that translation because <coughs> this, as we all know, that's not always the case. Um, you know, this is a slide just showing you a range of other things we've been looking at. Um, the thermal effects is also something we discussed a lot earlier this morning and, and it keeps coming up now also in the context of bubbles, so something we have uh, continued to ca very carefully look at, you know, that we don't get in, 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 into a thermal zone. Um, the, the hemolysis question is something that I think we as a field need, need to continue to look at uh, uh, carefully that, that recently came up. This is kind of older data that where we tended to look at that. Um, you know, there's a whole list, a laundry list of collateral tissues um, that, that we've looked at um, as well. Some of, some of them we've mentioned already um, as well. So, you know, other questions we have um, are around the biophysics. So what happens at the tissue device interface with, you know, with, with different um, devices and so forth. So, so one, of, one of the questions we had, and there were many, but one of them is, you know, what is the effect of contact force? So in order to study that, we just used the isolated heart model. Um, actually, what you don't see, the heart was submerged in half normal saline because we had a, a little <coughs> focal catheter there, so that we needed, we needed the half normal saline, which mimics the conductivity of blood to, to, make, to make that system work. And then, you know, we, we just basically varied the contact force over a range of, you know, somewhat clinically relevant, and then we went obviously pretty high on the high end. And, you know, we tried to correlate, is there really a strong correlation between contact force and lesion dimensions? And as you can see, the curve is not completely flat, so there's definitely a slight effect that we were able to detect. And we, we did some numerical modeling. We tend to do a lot of numerical modeling in conjunction with experimental studies. And this was actually more biomechanical modeling. And we, we obtained a similar curve. So we think like that the deeper lesions were really due to the tissue displacement, then, which then results in the, deep, in the field going deeper into the tissue and hence the, the deeper lesions. At least that's what we explained. Uh, and so we got, it, we got it published earlier this year. Um, you know, another question, oh, we're kind of a little bit more focused on the atrial arrhythmias for this conference, but, you know, in the atrium we have fibrosis as well. So, so one of our questions, this is mm -hmm. a collaborative work driven by the tool and, and Damian as well, and others um, looking at that this is actually a chronic porcelain infarct model. And our question, question was simply, can we ablate through SCAR? I mean, one of the many questions we had. So really trying to understand you know, kind of looking down the road, uh, the biophysics and the ventricle, but it may have applications for the atrium as well. And the answer is yes, we actually can. Now, it's not super surprising when you actually do look at the literature. So Schwartzman, as many, many years ago, in detail described the impedance of the scar, and it's actually the conductivity of scar is actually higher than myocardium, which is, doesn't seem intuitive. But so, so PF might be actually a, a great technology potentially for for VT uh, applications. So when we're going into the ventricle, um, yeah, and then my, I think that is my close to last second last slide. So you know. Um, we talked already about the thresholds, right? The thresholds of injury for IRE. So this is actually using uh, porcine tissues, so isolated porcine tissues. 
But we're fortunate enough in the lab, we're collaborating with the University of Minnesota, we also get access to human hearts. So, so we were actually able to test the, the pulse waveform in the porcine tissues and then also repeat that in human, in human tissues, these were hearts that were not deemed viable for transplant. And, and you can see we're kind of roughly in the ballpark. I mean, these, these um, human hearts, they had pre-existing disease, so that may explain a little bit the lower threshold. They were not, you know, not as fresh, I guess you could say. Uh, but anyway, so we were kind of in the ballpark, you know, so at least we feel like, you know, with, with our porcine uh, model, we can somewhat predict what's happening, only somewhat. In, in the humans. And, you know, we also looked at a, a, a traditional 100 microsecond waveform that you can see as expected, as a lower threshold. I know Bohr will, I think, talk a little bit more after this. Um, so, so, in conclusions, obviously, we're, you know, th there's, there's a lot of uh, basic research and knowledge available, but not just from the pulsed field ablation, but that's also why I think this conference is the great. <laughs> Um, from really from the field as a whole, where you know we we can leverage from and learn from, and so every time it's my second time here now, but every time I, I learn so many things. So it's really a great great conference, and I'm glad the conference keeps going. Um, so many knowledge gaps still exists. For example, uh, we talked about the mechanisms of some people call it reversible electroporation. I would actually call it more descriptively the EGM reduction because. We don't know if it's necessarily reversible. I mean, we think it is, but is it something else? Uh, what are the dynamics? How does it recover? Uh, we talked about mechanisms of cough response, and I, I also think that's some sort of a probably that there are a lot of receptors, not just the J receptors in the lungs. Um, there's there's very great vicinity between uh, the, the left superior pulmonary vein and, and you know, main bronchus, so that could explain some of that and that the trigger a cough response. But as a tool set, that is a clinical, you know, it, it is a, continu uh, a clinical problem, it, as is the neuromuscular stimulation. Um, so I think ongoing and planned basic and clinical research will hopefully it will help close those gaps. But I think we continue to be excited about TF. I think it's hopefully here to stay. But, yeah. Thank you. So for one thing, it's for sure, I mean, the, the, the human heart was not, not only not as fresh, but it was also much older than, than the young pig, of course. Uh, you, uh, I think you, you, you said one of the inclusions that we can expect in, 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 a, in a heart condition patients is, is, of course, the fibrosis. But the other part is, of course, uh, the, the, the adipose tissue, so the, the fat. And these inclusions will affect somehow the distribution of, of electric field, and probably the fat even more than the than the uh, the scar tissue. So this is definitely something that requires a little bit more uh, careful, I would say, uh, uh, modeling. Uh, and and of course, when when I say modeling is not only modeling but modeling that it are supported and validated by, by the experiments and, and observations. Uh, sure, Atul. Just two quick questions. Uh, one, you saw quite a wide standard deviation in what that lethal threshold is. I was actually surprised at how wide the standard deviation is. What's the reason for this wide standard so It's a very interesting question. I mean, we, you know, and Bohr will probably go a little bit more into methodology, we, how we did this threshold determination. But um, one of the things I, I will maybe not directly, but indirectly answer, answer that. Um, when you actually look at the literature of especially also ventricular lesions in PF, there is actually quite a wide standard deviation as well. We observed that in some of our own work. And then I started, I got curious about it as well. Um, and I'm not saying this is the explanation of this, but this is also an intricular tissue. So does it relate to things like orientation and so forth? Potentially, we tried in this study, we tried to control and, and look at orientation because you know, we're only looking at the superficial stain in this particular study. 
but when you go and you know and, and do your transaction transaction so you, yeah it, it is something interesting that i i don't know that we have a great explanation for that very yeah. It makes me wonder a little bit about, you know, cellular energetics and you've got disease states with impaired mitochondrial function, et cetera, <laughs> right? And so if this is, if a portion of this, I think it goes back to your comment about modes of cell death. If this is truly apoptotic, you know, at the margins, then uh, I think that was part of the presentation earlier, then that could account for some of the variability, right? It just depends on the cell type. As we know, it could vary from ventricle to atrium, right. from disease atrium to more normal, et cetera. And, and the other question I have is, uh, goes back to the micro bubble issue is, uh, and you mentioned hemolysis, right? So hemolysis is another potential source. So there's myoglobin in the urine, there's hemoglobin in the urine. Would you see hemolysis on, on echo? Like, is that a potential generation of micro bubbles or not really? It's, it's silent, right? It's just a, something that you can't monitor in real time. Yeah, just by the plasma free hemoglobin, is the, or in the urine, as you said. I would, I would like to uh, uh, add that I think it's important to, again, to understand where this comes from. Uh, so, is it the, let me say, the direct electroporation of erythrocytes, or it's, you know, or it's the, the shock wave that uh, uh, kills the erythrocytes as they pass by? Uh, it could be thermal, thermal damage. It could be thermal damage. Thermal damage. So, I, I think it's, it, it boils down, for me, it boils down to understanding. Yeah? But then again, it's, that's, that's my job. I want to understand. So... In, in the interest of, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just it. saying that, I mean, I think mitigating those micro bubbles is a key. And, and even if people, you know, we'll get to the top of, the, of waveforms later, but I think somehow disclosing the amount of bubble formation or, or whatever, I think is true. Yeah. Uh, okay, so in the interest of time, I would like to move on to uh, our next uh, 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 presenter, Scott Meyer from Boston Scientific. So, all right. Thank you, and uh, Devan, appreciate the opportunity to come and join join the panel with everything working out. Um, so, ten of my talk today, developing pulse field ablation products. So, I thought rather than repeating our own kind of internal scientific uh, work as well, dating back uh, over a decade, you know, through the ferropulse uh, work, uh, in addition to what we were working on internally at Boston Scientific, I take a higher level view of how we apply these tools and techniques and methods uh, to create empiric evidence on uh, the performance of our systems, uh, leading to clinical translation and what we've learned through the, through the full life cycle now as we've introduced the first generation product into the European marketplace. Here's my disclosure as well, just intending this to be uh, generalized. I want to be speaking specifically to performance of any of our devices. So just talking about the methods we use in general. Um, but before we get going, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at the overall marketplace. Um, you know, currently in 2023, we're, for atrial fibrillation ablation alone on a global scale, we're estimating that there'll be 850,000 uh, atrial fibrillation ablations, uh, roughly divided between uh, a little bit more encouraging small versus persistent patients and growing at 16% is our current estimate. And so that means, you know, in two years, we'll be treating over a million patients per year with atrial fibrillation ablation alone. Uh, to break that down by energy source, I think Dr. Verma highlighted, you know, historical perspective. 70% of that today is radio frequency, about 25% cryo, and currently 5%. Um, if you look forward, I think there's some, you know, talked a little bit about what's going on within, within Europe. This was a social media post I pulled from Peter Peichel to be a little provocative, uh, where at Eakin they've had uh, the you know, tech, various technologies in pulse field ablation uh, for several years, and uh, it has become the dominant uh, energy source that they use, uh, and largely has eliminated their use of point by point radio frequency ablation. So, you know, is this a window into the future? I think Dr. Verma talked about other future considerations, but it's certainly. 
uh, speaks to the enthusiasm uh, and also a need to help the clinical community rapidly understand this technology. So here's our own journey, um, starting, you know, I know Dr. Mickelson's here, you know, Fair Pulse founded 2020, uh, 2012, over a decade of translation work, many, many, many uh, preclinical studies, uh, iterating on waveforms, catheter designs concurrently. We won't go through the long history there. Um, culminating then in first uh, in human studies, which you know Vivek will be following. Uh, he may not speak to those, but those were paramount in the evolution of the technology and then resulting in the CE mark in 2021 and a few years of cumulative experience now surpassing uh, 25,000 patients and, and with the recent reporting on the manifest registry of 17,000 uh, patients gives us a, a very large window into the post-market experience. And then the more recent uh, advent first uh, randomized trial that was completed reported in the New England Journal and then the ongoing Advantage IDE, which will include uh, posterior wall isolation uh, as well as uh, pulmonary vein isolation. So I, I think Nora talked a little bit about this, you know, with the number of levers that we have uh, between you know, the catheter design, uh, the waveform design, and the eventual how you apply that specifically uh, to ablation targets. Um, we use a, a a very iterative process. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the tools we use, but you can think about, you know, what are critical, the electrode size, the electrode area, whether you're irrigating, uh, the spacing, the geometry, and certainly edge effects, which I think there's been a number of phenomena that have been highlighted. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to, we have a saying internally, not all PFA is equal. We have to be very careful. Each one of these systems will have unique performance requirements. Um, and so there will be at least at some point some level of standardization, but each one of these implementations uh, is unique at this standpoint. You know, in a waveform, a lot of iteration around you know, applied voltage, uh, pulse width, um, pulse count, interpulse delay. I think there's been some limited disclosure of what, what the parameter ranges that we use, particularly applied voltage. It's right on the screen. You can see it's, you can choose 1.8 to 2 kV for our system. Um, we disclose also that we use a bipolar, uh, biphasic waveform, at least for the uh, pentaspline catheter that's currently on the market, but other tools may use uh, different waveform configurations in the future. And I think, you know, this is a, love to use this uh, diagram on the dosing of, and obviously we need to marry those things and study them so that we can create uh, a formulation of catheter design with electrode design and waveforms that allow us to operate in a non-thermal, irreversible zone and you know, continue to ensure that we've got a margin under all of the operating conditions for the system. And that just includes the number of applications and the lesion spacing. Um, two of the principles I think that we talked about uh, earlier is electrograms abolish on the first initial PFA application, and what does that mean? Uh, there may also be a bit of a cardioversion effect. I think we're still trying to understand uh, how and when these come back and what indicators that has for reverse, uh, reversible or irreversibility. Uh, we tend to study, you know, out to 30 days and and use mapping and other tool sets and histopathology as, as uh, our main data sources. Uh, the other is, you know, PFA requires generally repeat applications to get the depth and the durability. Um, and that just goes into how we've developed uh, more prescriptive workflows uh, for the clinic. If we go to you know, so I'll spend just a little bit more time talking about some of the tools we go, but this is really kind of the translational process that has been used uh, for the first generation systems. Uh, tremendous amount of bent model and bench modeling and bench work, uh, then translating into preclinical work where we do a tremendous amount of dose ranging, and that was a lot, a lot of animal studies uh, because there's a very limited number of targets. Uh, if you're, if you're doing something like a pulmonary vein isolation in a swine model, there's only a couple targets, which means if you're doing any sort of uh, block design, if a number of parameters, the number goes up exponentially. Um, critical to the translation was uh, the three-month remapping uh, to take it into the human, uh, include some of the clinical conditions uh, that, you know, we talked about a catheter placement, catheter uh, maneuvering, uh, and then assuring that that 
prescriptive dosing was going to yield uh, durability up to 90 days, and then on into uh, you know, clinical trials, which support the safety and effectiveness. We talked a little bit about the importance of, of real-world evidence where, you know, we in industry think it's an important part that because of some of the, the complications that are uh, revealed come out in, in much larger data sets that we're continuing to learn from those data as well. So a couple of tools, we do use uh, computational modeling. I would say it's an, it's an iterative process where we use it to give us some, some base design rules. We try to understand what the potential, we use it to optimize electrode spacing. Uh, we also use it for much more complex form factors. Um, we also, and I think my, my videos are looping, but you know, we use um, thermal imaging modalities, some highly sensitive thermal imaging modalities that allow us to see uh, and characterize the performance of our system under uh, certain conditions. This you can see a five burst waveform and you see, you know, we have flow under this condition of the thermal camera and it's, uh, and if, if we were to remove that flow, you could get a very static idea of what the performance of the catheter is. Uh, we also use other methods to look, you know, very subtly for arcing or explosions, and those are really sen sensitive micro-explosion bubbles, and those are very sensitive to, like, any defects within the electrodes or any arcing that we, we uh, are looking for. Uh, again, and that's more related to you know, screen initial designs and manufacturing, and obviously we're also doing some uh, hyperbaric or, or maybe it's premature to call it just hydrolytic bubble quantification, but we also characterize our systems on the mm -hmm. edge there. And last, we also use some potato models. Um, this is usually before we go into preclinical, uh, just to screen and understand, uh, use controlled conditions and characterize some of the more complicated form factors before again, we're studying kind of in vivo, which adds more variability. Um, preclinical, again, this is probably relatively superficial, but, you know, it's essential to understand lesion durability uh, using chronic histopathology, again, also confirming uh, non-thermal ablation modality. So you can push it up to the edge. You may see very superficial thermal witness marks. It gives you an idea of where the margin is. So, again, we, we use very stringent require, requirements in our uh, histopath. Esophageal safety studies where, you know, this was done actually with Jacob Carruth and, and Vivek's uh, institution, deviating the esophagus and making sure that we're uh, adequately characterizing the selectivity of the, the waveform and, and device. Nerve and vascular safety, I think we've already talked about, uh, phrenic uh, and vagus injury, but also selectivity and, and PV stenosis and confirming that there's no effect. And that's been translated, I think, as you saw from Dr. Verma out into uh, the clinical results as well. And then lastly, doing a lot of work um, with both uh, with preclinical models and assessing uh, the impact of, of coronary uh, vasospasm. So kind of my last is opportunities and challenges. Uh, I was recently visiting with a physician. I think Dr. Verma talked about this as well. I need to continue to educate uh, our, our clinicians who are using these technologies uh, one made the comment, I get 50% of my information off of social media, which is a little bit scary. Uh, so, you know, we're active in producing, you know, webinars. We want to advance scientific publications. There's a huge opportunity now that I think we've seen, you know, the translation of some of these things and we can connect sort of the science with, with the, at least clinical observations. And then the second is, you know, hearing from the, the regulators on, how do we continue to, to reduce the dependence, you know, in particular of, of this technology on the need for large animal models and many of, the, of them. So the more we can focus on, you know, how do we manage through design iterations, um, differences and understand what impacts uh, the performance of the device and, and what does not, um, that's a, a really critical issue that we'll continue working on over the, the coming several years. So thank you for the time. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm not going to make any comment uh, on, on potato use uh, because I'm known for, for not liking yes. the potato as, as, as a model. 
of, of a heart or any kind of human tissue. Uh, but that you can ask me that, that, that aside. That that aside, it's uh, it's it's fine. Uh, no, I think we have more serious things to discuss. One of the things I've, I've seen in both uh, uh, presentations from from industry. I mean, you have developed, uh, uh, in addition to Potato, other other tools, which I think uh, are going close to what we have heard uh, uh, at the beginning from from Xenia. That I mean, the regulatory tools, yeah, science tools that could be potentially used. Is is there a way how actually that could be, and probably other, uh, not only industry but also groups around the world have developed uh, tests and. Uh, is, is there a way how, you know, FDA could integrate or try to integrate part of that uh, knowledge and, and bench tests that are available? Absolutely. Well, from my experience, it's it's possible, but it does take all stakeholders from the tools to get adopted, right? Not just us delivering them, but people using them, and regulators accepting them in the submissions. It has been done very successfully with drugs. Yeah. You know, there are mono layers, yeah. 2D cultures, but yeah. there are MPS systems, with multiple mm -hmm. inputs. You have you know, a neurocardiac system in our lab that you know, can be used for some of these questions. Yeah. We want to build a coronary artery model using IPS cardiac cells as well. Yeah. So there's a lot. Interesting stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm talking more general, not only about cells and, you know, uh, I'm, even, for example, in, in, instead of a, 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 a potato being used as, as a phantom, uh, maybe, you know, we, we, we know we can develop a, 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 an electronic uh, uh, load that can be used for testing the devices. And we can, of course, visualize uh, in a different way than with with the uh, uh, potato, the the field distribution and and things like that. So, I, I'm pretty sure in Europe, if we would write up a a, a, a project where we would have the industry and we would have the regulators and some research groups, we would easily get some funding for that. So I think that would be. Uh, maybe an avenue to 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 explore because it, it will benefit everybody basically. FDA, I guess it's, and you don't have to answer this, I guess, but, you know, there, there's going to be tweaks in, obviously, the pulse waveforms to optimize those. And then there may also be tweaks in catheter design, you know, which doesn't necessarily involve a whole redesign. And then there's going to be introduction of new catheters, right? So I guess where where does the line get drawn that you need a full clinical study versus just studies being done in cell monolayers? So, you know, let's say these guys, you know, they take the same catheter and add, I don't know, two electrodes, you know, I'm just going to make up stuff. Uh, and then in the background, there's some tweak to the... Uh, pulse waveform to accommodate those two extra electrodes. I mean, is that going to have to go to a full new IDE trial? Or, or you know, is that going to be more like using these monolayers or other surrogates? Well, you know how 510K program works, right? That's a potential equivalence demonstration for devices which are similar enough to the predicate. Um, David, you want to comment on this? I don't want to talk about, you know, regulatory pathways. <laughs> you know, Dr. Verma, I think that's a very great comment. If you can figure out the answer, we'd love to hear what you think, um, <laughs> because it's difficult. And as always, it depends. Um, I would some general comments that I would make is. Let's try doing one change at a time, not a new catheter and a new waveform. Let's do one or the other. That will help us out. Um, you know, it comes into what we determine is a large change versus small change. Um, it's a little bit of a, a fuzzy line, but we do have a, a team of people here that are really invested in this technology and have good engineering judgment who um, 
in general have a remarkable agreement on what are major and minor changes. So um, I don't have a, a straight answer for you, but I suggest, you know, let's advance all of these preclinical models, bench testing, animal testing, everything we can to reduce the amount of testing that needs to happen in human patients. Um, that's always going to be ideal. And, you know, we're going to take a risk-based approach and try and make our best judgment as we wade through this. And I really appreciate the foundational basic research that's going on in this group, which actually helps inform our decisions and I think also helps the companies um, have some confidence that they can um, make some small changes without it resulting in, okay, let's do a new clinical trial. Thank you. I think can I comment on this. Uh, yeah, sure. A, uh, a short one, please. Then. Yeah, short one. Um, yeah, so, so I think it will be really interesting. You know, I think we have a unique opportunity with pulse field ablation because it's a field-based therapy to really leverage numerical modeling more than for some of the other ablation technologies. So I just want to make that kind of yeah. as a general statement, and I, but then... I, and I think this is actually, it's an excellent transition now to the next present. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> it wasn't meant to be. Should, uh, uh, let's, let's, give, let's give Bar a uh, course, a possibility to convince us that model, numerical models actually can be useful. Well, thank you, and, uh, <laughs> thanks also to you, Daniel. Um, so now I can, I'm going to be talking about numerical modeling, specifically in the scope of post field ablation. Uh, when we talk about numerical modeling, the important thing is to know that what we're trying to do is solve equations for some physics problems that are, the equations themselves are very well known, some of them for decades, some of them even for centuries, and they, you, can, you can draw them in a, in a single line, but actually to solve this, uh, these equations, it's, it's only possible to do that in a few, analytically, I mean, in a few very simplified uh, specific geometries. But if you want to do something like we did here, for example, to try to to, so to predict what kind of what the lesion would do in a, in a hum, in, in an atrial uh, atrial tissue, then of course there is really no way, no other way to do that than to use numerical modeling. Now, it, and this kind of approach can also give us insight into some quantities that we are otherwise really unable to measure at this kind of detail and resolution in in really in practice. Now, <clears throat> it's also important to be aware when doing modeling that uh, appropriate validation needs to, be, needs to be done. Although these physical laws and equations are well known, the, model, the models come with certain parameters that you need, to, you need to put in, and you need to make sure that what you're doing in the model actually really captures the reality of what you're trying to model in an accurate way. That's where validation really comes in. And... Um, in the terms of validation, we also need to be careful to, to, to keep in mind the, con the context of views. And what I mean by that is to not ask the model to tell us something that is very far away from where we actually validated the model. Because then, in that case, the, the confidence really uh, in, the, in the results of the model really goes down a lot. And that also is important in the terms of you know, how important the modeling will be in the decision making, uh, just in the development itself, or as well as in the, in the regulatory process. Because if, if the model basically is too far away from where we, we validated this, then the confidence really goes down. And uh, <clears throat> now so far, I've only been talking about the, the physical effects. So talking about the electric field and temperature and so on. But now in, uh, to get to, to an actual clinical therapy, we also need to include in some way the biological effect. And that's what we're trying to achieve as, as the end point. So our goal is not electric field. Our, our goal is cell death, uh, also, of course, of the tissue which we want to kill. And um, so we need to introduce a biological effect into the modeling. And the simplest way that to do that is by, by using a numerical uh, a little field threshold. That was something that was also presented by Maura in the very beginning and also mentioned right now uh, by, uh, by Daniel. Uh, but in this case, even though we're doing that, we, we also need to keep in mind that this is not really a realistic representation where what we do with the threshold is we say, all of the cells below this electric field strength 
are, uh, will be alive and the, all of the cells above this little, little threshold will die. And in reality, this is more like a, a smooth transition and where, um, so already at the beginning when we introduce the little electric field threshold, we need to realize that we are making a simplification. And that is also, I think, part of the answer to a tool's question before. Um, as to why we have this relatively large spread in the study that Daniel was mentioning, uh, relatively large standard deviation in terms of, of, the, of the actual threshold. Uh, I'll just mention here briefly again that the, the difference between the human and the, and the pig heart, it was statistically significant, but why Daniel was being a bit cautious is that we only had three actual hearts human hearts to work with. That's why, uh, you know, we're trying to, to just limit the amount of um, the weight of the statement. Now, a, a more um, involved approach on the bringing in the biological effect is to use uh, some kind of cell death models. And there are a couple of different models uh, out there. Uh, this is just one example that we used in a study in a collaboration with the group of Dr. Davlos and where you can also take into account the number of pulses that are used in the actual treatment. So this is now going from a certain electric field threshold, which as Mara was talking, we need, to, we need to find for every new parameter to a slightly higher level where we can at least vary at least one parameter by using the model uh, uh, in, in that way. Now, of course, um, last but not least, it's also uh, the thermal damage was mentioned a couple of times already. It, there, it, you know, using just a simple threshold, uh, I've heard from somewhere, anywhere from 50 to 55 five degrees Celsius as a threshold for cardiac tissue damage. Um, you can also use Arrhenius kinetics as a more advanced model of how the tissue will die. Um, now, these are all the ways of how we can use, introduce the, the um, numerical, biological response in the, the numerical modeling. And this is just now, I'll show a brief example of how we use numerical modeling to just answer this kind of uh, question. And um, in the context here was the, the question, can, can PFA cause lesion, lesions even at a distance? So even when there is not a perfect contact between the electrodes and the tissue. And in the, in the experiment themselves, which are done on ex vivo hearts, the, um, they used a, uh, this kind of plastic shell to hold the catheter uh, in place and to have a fixed offset between the catheter and the tissue this, that was filled with blood. And the concern was that this could affect the electric field distribution in such a way as to, to skew the outcome of the, of the experiment. So here is where the numerical uh, modeling comes in. We built a model and validated it on the experimental uh, results and then removed the shell inside the model and replaced it with just an unlimited blood pool, which would be more representative if we were working inside the heart. And now, based on this validation, these are the experimental results where you can see the lesions in white. And we can see that the model really represented the, the reality into a very, uh, very well. And you can actually to the point of capturing this kind of small ear-like structures that you can see on the, on the edges of the lesions uh, here and here. And based on that, we had good confidence that the model was really showing what was going on. So we can now in the model without, uh, in the numerical model without um, the, the, the shell to limit the electric field, we can still see the lesions being formed when the catheter was offset from the tissue. So this is a way of, you know, still being on the safe side with modeling, but using it to, to really see some effects that are not, that you cannot really reliably reproduce experimentally. Um, now, just one final word of warning when we're talking about numerical modeling, um, although, as I said, the equations there are known, we, we need to feed the equations with, with uh, a lot of parameters, such as tissue conductivity, so just to name just one. And these parameters, ideally, you would, you would know their exact value, and then, therefore, we, you know, with solving the numerical modeling, assuming your discretization is fine and everything, you would get the exact value and the exact result every time. Um, but unfortunately, that is not what happens in reality, because the actual parameters are, you know, to, uh, 
to a certain degree uncertain. Therefore, they should uh, more accurately, accurately be re, uh, represented as a kind of distribution. And this means that also the output of the model should, is not an, a certain one numeric value, but should be a kind of distribution. Now, the question arises how, how to deal with that. And there are a, a couple of known methods, methods to do that, and they, they come under the umbrella term uncertainty quantification. This is something that could be also implemented in the in the future in, in this field. So this is the, the end of my presentation. Just quickly to, to summarize, we can use numerical modeling to really find some something that cannot be measured, but we need to always be keep in mind that the validation of model is important and also to, to not go too far away from where we validated because as the model will surely at some point break down, as we saw with the generation of bubbles. So without accounting for the boiling, you will not see the bubbles in the model and you will also get inaccurate results for the temperature then. And thank you very much again. Thank you. So I too often see uh, papers and read papers on modeling, which are, let me say, a, a mathematical exercise or numerical exercise. And when if we want to rely and this was, I think, one of the questions was, can we use models, you know, in, in, in developing the second generation, maybe, uh, devices and so on? Uh, I think if well validated and within the, 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 the context of use, so close to where they are validated, they can be a reliable tool, I think. And that is important. But of course, in order the people to have the possibility to develop this kind of models. They need to know what waveforms and what vectoring is used. I'm already going towards the to, towards my presentation because if you don't know that, then the modeling is just pure academic exercise. And and that is that is one of the concerns that I really have with both non-disclosing and, and the modeling that is becoming available. May I offer comments? Sure. FDA released final guidance on assessing the credibility of computational modeling and simulation today. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> that should be very relevant. They'll be a webinar in January for industry to join and learn more about that guidance. Okay, great. Uh, yes, Rafael. I was just going to say, follow up on Boris Dr. your comment that, you know, it, and we've talked about this many times, it's not just that the, the electric field threshold, but that electric field distribution, as you can see it. So we would do confidence intervals on what that field distribution is, but you're only going to really understand that field distribution with the, the right waveform, you know. So yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. Uh, we have uh, two more speakers. So I know Vivek, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've seen you for 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 a while. On the screen, uh, I also know that you have a lot of slides, so the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Daimia. Can you hear me okay? So I'm going to just get through my slides quickly. So first, again, thanks again for the very kind of invitation for letting me do this uh, remotely. I do have a lot of slides, so I'll go through them quickly. So um, the manifest PF registry, I'm just going to show you this efficacy slide because this includes over 1,500 patients. and. We see that the effectiveness is looks to be at least as good as pulse as thermal ablation, but this is something that still needs to be actually validated with real good comparative slot, uh, studies. The problem with current studies is that we're looking at a established technology where investigators are past their learning curve versus a new one, and really you need to compare them directly. Next, the other important question, of course, is the autonomics. Um, we know from our studies and other studies. Next, that there is actually the impact of pulse field on the periatrial ganglia is substantially less than with thermal ablation, but it's not zero. There is some effect. Next. And the question is, what is the effect both acutely as well as long-term? And this is an open question. In terms of long-term success, next, there's another question. This is an interesting study from the circuitous investigators where they looked at outcomes, not just acutely, but progression to persistent atrial fibrillation. What's important is that the outcomes in terms of recurrent AF were identical between the energy sources, but there was a greater progression with cryo than with RF, and we don't know why. So the question is, how will pulse field affect progression? And that we need to understand. Next. In terms of safety, next, next, um, we 
published the manifest PF study of about 1,500 patients or so, but recently we presented the manifest 17K experience at the American Heart Association. Next. And what we saw next, and this is again with a single PFA catheter, was the overall major complication rate was 1%, which is really quite good. Next, if we look at the different types of complications, I think probably the most important is the fact that the esophageal complications were zero, at least in this uh, analysis. And I think an open question, surprisingly, even now, at least for me, is why is the esophagus spared? It could be, and I think many people believe, and Damian, I think you're one of those, that believes that it, it's because that the healing is different. Next. But then we also have to explain this study. This is a study of, of uh, esophageal imaging, a non-randomized comparison between thermal and pulse field ablation. Next. With cryo... RF and PF, you have ablated atrial tissue, next. But with cryo and RF, while you have ablated esophageal tissue, next, with pulse field, you don't have any effect on the esophagus. Now, this is imaging at about the three-month time, I'm sorry, the three, um, within 24 hours time point, the same, it looks the same at, uh, at three months, but we need to reconcile this, probably for every single PFA waveform and technology, next. Uh, next, next other complications, no PV stenosis, uh, minimal to rare phrenic nerve paralysis, vascular complications like what all procedures can happen next. Um, importantly, the tamponade rate is relatively low at 0.4%, the stroke rate around one in a thousand. So I think that's all good news. Next. And the mortality rate was on the order of three and 10,000. So that's again, quite low, uh, comparable to and perhaps superior to thermal ablation. Spasm, we've, several people have mentioned this, so I don't want to speak too much about it, but I do want to uh, raise one important issue. So first, the overall spasm rate was about one in a thousand. Next. And what you see is, look, spasm is not new to electrophysiology. This is a study that was published, uh, published of 20,000 over, 20, more than 20,000 patients in Japan. And spasm was identified in about 0.2% of the population. Next. And uh, this was relieved with nitro next. It happens a little more with cryo than with RF next. And the important point is, I think there's two types of spasm. There's the generalized spasm, which I think is what's happening with things like cryo and RF, because these were lesions largely focused on the pulmonary veins. I think it's more the prismetal type thing, probably driven by some autonomic slash sympathetic phenomenon. Then there's the proximity-related spasm, which I think several people already sp spoke about when the energy is delivered next to the coronary. So there are open questions as to the potential for each of these and how best to prevent or manage these. Next. In the 17K experience, again, it was one in a thousand for the overall spasm rate. If we look at the type of spasm as best we could discern, next, most of these are proximity-related spasm, meaning the spasm was next to where the PFA energy was delivered. But the overall generalized spasm rate did occur, and it occurred around 0.02% of the full cohort. So somewhat less than what we see with thermal ablation. Next, we, there are EKG changes with spasm, no surprise, some hypotension. Next, some people with chest pain, including two patients who had ventricular fibrillation, very important. Of course, they were managed. And nitro was used in these patients. Next. How often will spasm become significant? Should we give it prophylactically or as needed? That depends partly on the frequency of this. What's the best dosing strategy? And next, are there other coronary effects? I think it was mentioned earlier that, you know, there are preclinical data from other labs and our lab that you can see intimal hyperplasia. And this is actually something that's been reported a decade ago. The question is, does this manifest clinically? And we don't know the answer to that question. Next. Um, differential healing. This is an important point. So this is a non-randomized comparison. Of what happens after pulse field versus thermal ablation? You see changes in compliance, and both, with both pulse field and thermal, you see um, a differences acutely. Next, with thermal, it stays this way at three months. Next, versus with pulse field, it largely recovers. So how important is this compliance issue? We don't know, but let me show you an abstract that was presented at the European Heart Meeting. Next. So this was a study in patients who had previously failed thermal ablation, coming back for redo procedures, but had some degree of pulmonary elevation, pulmonary pressure elevation, likely because of stiff left atria for the first procedure. When you compare RF versus um, pulse field, 
not again, non-randomized. What you see is with RF on the graph on the bottom, there was a further increase in pulmonary pressure versus no change with pulse field. Again, this is a non-randomized comparison, but certainly very interesting and could be very important in terms of long-term outcome in our patients. Next. There's certainly the unknown unknowns. And in Manifest uh, 17, we did have one new unknown unknown, at least new to me, next, which is that there was a 0.03% rate of hemolysis-related renal failure requiring dialysis. Next. This was, uh, next occurred in five patients, all with persistent AFib. Next. All had uh, normal baseline creatinine or near normal. Next. The lesion set was complex in all the patients with a lot of lesions, 143 mean lesions, where let's say normal is somewhere between, let's say, 50 to 70 or 80. Next, dialysis was used in all patients. They all recovered and everything is good ultimately. But this is not something that I certainly would have expected uh, even a year ago. So I think this is somewhat new. Fortunately, this is relatively easy to deal with just by giving um, saline during the procedure. Next. So... Um, I think this is my last slide. The, the final point is the issue of PFA1 versus PFA2 that was just being discussed. Next, what can actually be transferred between technologies? I think this is a very important question, both from a clinical perspective and certainly from a regulatory perspective. I think none of us want to do a, a big pivotal trial for every single change in a waveform. On the other hand, we certainly need data. Durability is an important issue, though I think that the lower bar of clinical effectiveness is probably what will be used, and I'm fine with that, but the clinical field does have to figure out durability with each of these waveforms. On the safety side, I, I think there's some things like uh, PV stenosis, which are going to be low in all waveforms I'm not particularly worried about. I still have open questions about changes in the effect on the esophagus, uh, so I think that's important. And the last two points I want to make is that I've really been speaking about the atrium. Obviously, they're VT ablation, which is, is a great potential uh, uh, target for pulse field ablation, and that, that has its own issues. There's also the issue of sublethal reversible pulses, which can be very useful in cardiac electrophysiology. We published a manuscript on this, and I, I think this is an area where I'd love to see some more basic and clinical work because I think it could be really useful for us. And then the last point is a point that I raised earlier. I just want to mention this. Again, this is the whole issue of microbubbles. There's a lot talked about microbubbles. Again, I just want to emphasize one point. With most PFA technologies, when we deliver the lesions, there is a, um, a shower of microbubbles with every single lesion. If those microbubbles were important, when we did brain imaging, you would expect to see the whole brain peppered with microemboli. And that's not what we see. So I really, um, uh, I really think that, that the microbubble question, while it's not, I'm not going to say it's completely irrelevant because I'm sure that with changes in the waveform, maybe you could make macro bubbles. But in terms of the list of my concerns, it's really near the bottom for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think I was pretty good in changing the slides. <laughs> I was actually quite good. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, questions, comments? I would go. Uh, uh, I would like to tie up uh, uh, some observations and, and some comments before. I mean, the coronary spasm, and, and obviously now the, the the hemolysis. These are all, you know, in a way, uh, unexpected. They they came up after some time of of, of use, yeah? or even if it was seen at the beginning, was not uh, uh, you know uh, considered perhaps with enough of, of weight. Uh, now, you say, uh, Vivek, that uh, this can be easily, well, this can be handled uh, pre, with pre-medication of nitroglycerin. Uh, I've seen, uh, I think, uh, Tony, you have shown a, a, a graph from, uh, from HRS last year published, uh, and I know that there was an attempt with the nitroglycerin. And I noticed there's a, a, a slight difference, and maybe, Daniel, you can comment on that part. Uh, so is this really working every time, and it, it works, or it, it's good enough as it works? Well, sorry, do you want me to answer that, Damien? Yeah, you can. You can. And then maybe Tony and, and Daniel can, can chip in. Yeah, look. You need to have very high doses of local nitro, and those are important points, high doses and local. So to get high doses 
of local nitroglycerin. When I say local, I mean at the at the actual point of ablation, you're either going to inject the coronary, which is the most efficient but the least clinically useful, right? Because you don't want to inject, you don't want to access the coronary every single time, or you give very high doses systemically, so as to achieve high doses at the coronary level. The latter is much more clinically useful, but the downside of that is that when you give high doses of nitro, obviously the blood pressure falls because all the vessels dilate. Um, so you have to pre-treat with a, with a um, vasoconstrictor. So you give a vasoconstrictor like phenylephrine or um, uh, norepinephrine, and then you give the nitro at very, I mean, industrial doses in order to get high local concentrations. If you do all that, then yes, it works actually quite well. So I remember seeing a presentation in, in uh, I think it was Hong Kong, and, and there was also a, a, a paper. Uh, I forgot the name, but uh, and I have the face in front of me. Uh, there are two two types actually. One is uh, uh, so the, the the spasm, the constriction, and the other was the hyperplasia afterwards. So uh, apparently there is a something which might be reversible, and there is something which might be observed after some time. Anybody wants to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, there's different issues, right? One is a acute spasm that can be yeah. uh, that can be affected by nitroglycerin, so that's going to be likely a, a calcium slash cyclic GMP issue, right? The other is neonatal hyperplasia, which is something that can occur with any energy source. We've seen this with RF, we've seen this with cryo. The difference, I think, with pulse field is because the field is can be bigger and can interact with the with the coronary let's say more efficiently, then the question of, you know, eventual uh, proliferation is, is something that we need to understand. We know it can happen in animals. We don't know how often it happens in patients, but I think they're completely different mechanisms. That's, that's my only real point. I, I think I agree. Tony, you want to comment? No, really. I mean, this was a concern expressed at the beginning by the FDA, yeah. and this is very relevant. I mean, the hyperplasia, I mean, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel? No, no further comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've read the paper. Can I, can I have no, one man. more comment? Yeah, yeah sure. I think I think, you know, everybody should remember, right, in very close proximity to the electrode, there are very high gradients, right? And so proximity matters with these sorts of selectivity issues. And so, you know, it needs to be, you know, further studied yeah. of, I, you know, what, what are those effects? I mean, most of the data out there, I think, is via very close direct application. Yeah. Right? I, I think I read it needs to be 6.3 milliliters away from in, in one paper, but that is difficult to say because we don't know. We know the threshold depends on the waveform and, and so on. So, you know, what does 6.3 millimeters and how, how do you control, uh, Vivek and, and Atul, mm -hmm. how do you control the 6.3 millimeter distance from the coronary arteries in, in the procedure? You don't. You don't. <laughs> that's, that's what they wanted to hear. But I think the, the issue is that, you know, one of the big promises of PFA is that it's supposed to be easy and fast. And I think if, if we keep adding all these little things, like remember to inject the atropine, remember to paralyze at this point, remember your boluses of nitro, remember this, remember that, and, and for, you know, bolus saline at this point to prevent hemolysis well, induced. I mean, then, then it's getting so, because there are already people saying, you know what, I'm not going to move away from the cryo balloon. They, they are doing these procedures in under an hour. They're happy. They've never had a complication. Uh, now with RF, there are some people using high power short duration. They're doing their procedures in under an hour reliably. And there are some people saying, you know what, I'm not going to move away. I mean, I'm not saying PFA is not going to be the winner. But I'm just saying that when we see that I can experience in Prague. I mean, that's that's a very specific hospital with very specific interests. But whether that blue wave actually mm. happens as big uh, as as the companies may bet, yeah. uh, 
there's still going to be plenty of people doing RF and cryo, and there are going to be some who say, you know what, it's simple. Uh, I can do cryo balloon on <clears throat> mild sedation, and I don't have to tr pre-treat with anything. Okay. So uh, let's, in, in the interest of time, let's move on. I have the privilege, actually, uh, or, or it's not the privilege, I don't know, because you're probably exhausted all, uh, to, to present as, as the, the last uh, presenter. So uh, I've been told we're not going to tell, we're not going to disclose. But anyway, the pathway forms in, in the PFA. I, th I think it's really, uh, it's, it's a question. Uh, for me, it, it's not. But to, I think it's, it's important to discuss why would that really be relevant? I mean, why would we want to have uh, a disclosure of the waveforms? <laughs> now, the, the, the fact is that the, the concept of the little threshold depends on the pulse waveform. So we change the pulse parameters, we, we change the threshold. That, that's one. And currently, the models are based on little threshold. Even if we introduce the, the biological response and the distribution of cell death and things like that, this still depend on the uh, on, on the waveform. Uh, the the heating and, and the bubble generation. Even though uh, I, I've heard you clearly, Vivek, and we had this discussion before, bubbles are very low and on on the priority list or, or on the concern list. I, I still think it's important to know that the waveform will affect the temperature and will in will will actually act on what kind of bubbles we will see and as we will uh, see and we have heard before and i will show you uh, pain and muscle contraction depend on pulse parameters waveform so uh, maura showed uh, six parameters to handle actually there's nine uh, that i can think of so we have uh, enormous parameter space so are we going to run, uh, you know, tests for every single combination of this or, or, or not? Do, does any company, can, can, can we as a, as a society, can we support the development of such uh, uh, devices over and over again from, from the scratch? And I know uh, there is an attempt to, to, to mitigate that. But again, we need to go uh, and broaden that spectrum of, of the pulse parameters in order to accommodate that. So I've seen in many, and this is just one example because it's so well known, the study, and it, it started from the monophasic then to biphasic, and then of course, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know, but it, it was the biphasic one and two and three. So we see that the, the, the waveform matters. If, if nothing else, it does matter uh, in terms of uh, uh, durability, in terms of uh, pulmonary vein isolation, and it probably matters also in, in the other aspects. Uh, this comes from, from, from the group of uh, uh, Rafael Davalos, and, and uh, uh, there was, a, I think, uh, uh, Borja uh visiting from, from uh, Barcelona, him. And, and the, the funny thing is, well, again, not funny. We know IRE with monophasic pulses needs lower voltages. When we go and we move to biphasic pulses, two microseconds, five microseconds, two, we see we need to use higher voltages, higher amplitudes. What does that mean, higher amplitudes? Well, to be honest, I don't know. Do we have equal efficiency? Do we have equal, uh, you know, bubble generation? Do we have equal, I don't know. So we need to test. The, 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 the interesting part is that when you do in vitro experiments already, you see that you will determine different threshold, whether you will be looking at three hours or at 24 hours. So the time when you will determine cell death already will affect your little threshold. Not only that, if you keep the pulse duration, the pulse number, and you only change the interpulse, uh, uh, the pause, the, the delay between the, the, the positive and negative will also affect the threshold. <laughs> so that is, I think, something that we have to have in mind. So small changes in the waveform may affect critical outcomes like little threshold. Okay, so now the muscle contraction and pain sensation. 
there has been a lot of uh, 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 talk about uh, how you know the biphasic H fire policies, how they mitigate the, uh, uh, the the contraction and the pain. There was no actual study about the pain, so we 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 actually designed and Alexandra uh, Matei and maybe Zalinka. No, Alinka is not here. We actually did a human study and uh, uh, in patients and. We tested lots of different parameters, yeah? a lot, yeah? and then the analysis uh, allowed us, the, the clustering allowed us to actually see that we can find groups of parameters which cause high pain, low contraction, and the other way around. And it's only, it's not only the duration of the pulse; it's also the the, the, the delay between the, the positive and negative, and, and of course, the pulse repetition rate. So, even on the level of the pain and contraction. Now, in addition to that, we have the little threshold uh, 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 that, that depend, of course, on the, on the waveform. We, all of this, except for the uh, little threshold, uh, also depend on the vector. So, how the field will spread around. So, in the absence of, you know, disclosing the waveforms and the vectoring, we took back in 2019, we, we Bar did the calculations, we took what was in the literature and Bar did uh, 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 the calculation. I presented that at the AF Symposium. So this is basically, it's, it's a model just to, to, to give you a, a, a glimpse of, of what is in it. And then what we did is we changed Two things at the same time, yeah? So not one at a time. Yes, you can. You go and you look at the first row, you use the focal catheter, and you only change the, the waveform. But then you can also go uh, in, in columns, and you can change uh, the catheter, the, 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 the geometry. But of course, you can go across. And we, if we have the models that allow us to, to do this kind of, you know, things. We cannot only tell what is the voltage that we need to apply because we know what is the little threshold for each specific combination, the catheter vectoring and the waveform, but we can also calculate and predict the temperature distribution. So I would act that at, at the end, yeah, I would just like to, to emphasize that Without knowing the, the vectoring and without disclosing the waveforms, the comparison of, of these different systems and the studies and the results, even in vitro and in vivo, preclinical, it, it's just not possible. The models cannot be validated and used from one study to another because it just, it's every has to be done by itself, validated for the waveform from company one the waveform number three and, and, and so on. Uh, the other is that in general, of course, that hinders the progress of the science. And, and that worries me because, you know, I would like to progress, not to do the calculations, you know, for the next 20 years uh, uh, and, and, and validating the models for, for, for 20 years. We would like to develop something which is pretty general and then perhaps uh, uh, together with the FDA, make it available for everybody. Now, uh, it also obviously makes research and development, I think, prohibitively costly and uh, potentially endangers patient safety. Yeah? Because if it's not there, if it's unknown, you know, there will be a company eventually that will try to develop a new device and maybe it will slip through, I don't know, not FDA, not notifying EU bodies, but maybe some other countries. And those lives matter as well. Now, and, and this was something that actually uh, uh, we discussed with David uh, Heinz a couple of times. Uh, it, it also puts patients uh, needlessly at the risk of being subjected to suboptimal waveforms and, and, and devices. And I don't think it's fair. So I'll stop here. And maybe there's going to be some echo. Maybe, you know, companies will now say, okay, here it is. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> so we 
we can uh, have uh, a discussion on this, of course, but we can also go back and we can have discussion on other things. Damian, yeah, can I ask a question? Yes, please, be the just. Yeah, so um, just, I did a quick comment on the question. A comment is that, um, look, I completely agree with you. It would be great if everyone revealed it. It's not going to happen. I just don't see it. But I do think that people are going to put oscilloscopes and eventually, I'm sure it's already been done by some people, but I'm sure that the ones that are clinically approved, eventually this, this will get out there in the community. So we'll find out. But my question really to you is, based on everything you know, I'd be curious to understand, um, you know, as much as you can say, can you give some, if somebody was, to, was thinking of creating a new pulse field catheter, can you give us some idea? What are the things you think that um, uh, the lessons you've learned, let's say, in the optimal sort of, uh, design, let's say, of, of your waveform or perhaps even of the catheter for atrial ablation, meaning some degree of selectivity, some degree of depth, and ventricular ablation, where selectivity probably matters less and depth matters more. To, to be honest, just going through what we've heard today, I think from Sama's presentation, the edges are going to be very important, I think. The, the 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 geometry you know how you I don't know how sharp they are because this is we know I mean we we know this by heart that when you have a sharp edge you have the the concentration of the current density there and that is where you will heat up and that is where you will get the boiling and so on so I think it's it's go this is definitely something uh, that uh, it's easily done I mean in terms of solving this problem. Just, you know, take a, a, a fast camera and a little bit of brush or I don't know what how you call it. And you, you come up with a very nice edges that prevent from this kind of thing. So I think this is the easy part. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe somewhere you have. Uh, yeah. Do, you mentioned duty cycle. Yeah. You mentioned duty cycle. So that's also something that is that means uh, I mean. The waveform and the let me say the intensity of delivery, yeah, and so that I mean these are the the the, the obvious ones that I can come up with. Maybe I mean you've been part of we have we have the privilege here of having Stephen Mickelson here. So you you went through the childhood of the PFA. Yeah, yeah. Those are all great comments. One of my will be yeah. Designing geometry. I mean, geometry is one of the most important things because you have an inverse square um, and the major determinants of waveform design. And you've identified them all. You know, it's pulse duration, repetition, repetition times, and you know, and phase can matter, and all those things matter. So it's very hard, as everyone re I think is now recognizing, to compare apples and apples and oranges and knowing. I do have a question, you know, when, when you have such complexity there, the one thing that we can thank God for is that we're dealing with electric fields and not with thermodynamics, as much, right? <laughs> you know, because heat transfer is a way more difficult problem to solve. But the, that said, you know, um, you know, coming back to this idea of disclosure, you know, I, you know, Vivek's probably right. Nobody wants to show what their secret sauce is, and a lot of the secret sauce seems to be in the actual waveform development. After years of playing in this, it, there's probably less there than you would think. Because if you you can do it with an old defibrillator, you can do it with high fire, you can do it with a with nanosecond, right? you can do it with all. You can do a lot of ways, and it's the nuances that matter. And and I would ask the FDA this, and maybe the notified body in Europe and other countries as well. Um, if if some drug company came to you and wanted to run a clinical trial and would not disclose what the drug was. Um, would you would you be interested in it? Would you let them run the trial? And as a scientist, if you publish a paper and people can't reproduce your results because they don't know what you did, then is that science? Yeah, the first one that was supposed to you in a way. Well, FDA knows the parameters. It's a yeah. question about the MD. Companies do disclose to FDA. Yeah. As it comes to the science, uh, we have a lot of crappy science, to be honest, even without this, not disclosing. So, no, I mean, 
It's, it's funny, now that we have electronic journals and we have no limit for the materials and methods, the disclosure and the, the, the accuracy of you know, the methods and the materials that are actually disclosed in the papers is going down instead of going up. So the reproducibility is, 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 a, is actually a, a, a very uh, painful spot for, for, for science. So it, not only when it comes to PFA, it's general. Uh, my concern uh, with, with the not disclosing is, is another thing that I didn't bring up. If anybody wants to do basic research, so how do you do basic research? Because you need the pulse generator. So which one can I use? Um, can I buy one from you? Probably yes, but it's going to be too expensive for a basic researcher because it's a clinical device. Plus, it's not going to work in my petri dish. <laughs> yeah. So I think that is another uh, issue. Yeah. I mean, we have on the market we have great uh, power generators, electroporators. Tomorrow we have a display uh, uh, of, of power generators here at school, and you can reproduce any kind of waveform. <clears throat> You only need to tell us. And not only that, we're going to get funding from EU, uh, from NIH. You, you don't need to pay for research at all. So it's it's a win-win situation. So I don't I don't get it. I was actually going to ask the, the industry guys, like, how long do you think the non-disclosure is really going to last? Because at the end, it's a generator, it's pulse waveforms, it's a catheter, it's an entire system, right? And the system can be protected by IP. Like, it doesn't just have to be pulses, you know? I mean, everyone knows the ingredients of a, of a drug, you know, but the drug gets protected for whatever it is, 20 years under patent law. So nobody else can come and just put the same ingredients together. So, uh, I mean, I, I have a feeling, and tell me if I'm completely off about this, that for five, six years, they'll be all like, everyone's keeping it close to their chest, but the FDA knows what you're all doing. And I think you made the point that there's not a lot there. Like, I, I have a feeling that when it all gets disclosed, There'll be a little few nuances here and there, but it won't be like, whoa, these guys are doing this and these guys are doing it. Everyone will be operating within a small little virgin area. Yeah, exactly. And one will be on this end, one will be on this end, and, and it'll. I think it'll be a huge, uh, you know, not let down, but it's not going to be all revealed. It's going to be like a... No. Uh, a tool point you then. That was anti We won't disclose it. No, no. <laughs> I think, I, I don't know, I, I have a feeling that... Well, what do you guys think? Like five years from now, six it's years great, you from know, now. It's a great point. I, I, I don't know, to be honest, right? when, when this is going to happen. It's obviously for proprietary reasons right now. Everything is still so new. Um, and, and, but I do get what mm -hmm. Long is saying. Um, I don't get the patient risk, I have to admit. I, mean, I, I don't think... I, the the patient with... risk, it's, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not with the, I would say, with thoroughly designed uh, uh, devices, but I've seen some garage-like devices. Yeah? <laughs> And you know they they are not necessarily going through the through the gold standard uh, agency like the FDA. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they may go through other agencies, and uh, uh, so that yeah. Uh, and of course, the other thing is they may not have the protections in built in that I'm sure you have built in. Because I know that electrophysiologists, they like to do a, a thorough job, and they would deliver uh, more if, if they could. And I mean, that's just human. Yeah? Uh, 
with, with the care for the patient, they would deliver more. And we've heard before today, not within the, the round table, but we've heard before, I think Richard said, more is not always better, yeah? Because we, we can lose then the selectivity. I mean, we can drive this to, to thermal, to, to be just another thermal, you know, ablation modality. It's, it's, it's not far. And I've heard the non-thermal irreversible electroporation before. Rafa? <laughs> I'll make a few, a few minor comments, but um, one, I do think it, this was kind of alluded to before. As long as they're, I think the most important thing is that they're getting to like the FDA and the other regulatory things, not just to wait for them, but actually the, the oscilloscope output in case there's some spike in the current or something that you're actually getting the real signal, not just the reported signal. And I, I don't think any company would have a problem with that. I also think a lot of the things with the safety can get mitigated if they disclose like and things again i think the companies would have no problem like this is the amount of energy being inputted into the tissue and stuff like that i don't think companies would have any problem saying that now this the little secret sauce i mean as an academic of course i'd like to know i just i don't know if that was ever going to happen but, but i do think they could do a lot of things to disclose that that they wouldn't mind in terms of safety yeah. show all so, so let's let's try to maybe, maybe you know I, I think we do i mean the requested information that we provide to regulators around you know we form parameters but you know maybe to answer dr burma's question you know there's a lot of parameters on the list and you highlighted in your talk many of them matter as you try to find right the right operating window and you know <clears throat> We spend years, I think you've seen, right? You spend years and in huge investments to find that window, and then it's not the same window for a pentaspline catheter as it is for a point catheter. There's just different operating spaces. So I think at some point, learning will get out there. Yeah. It will diffuse out into the community. But at this point, there's not really an incentive for us to share with another competitor I, so they can try to strap up our learning. I agree, but I, I think it comes down back to to, to David Hazelwood. Uh, actually, uh, on the slide, he had the waveform parameters, and he said equivalence is, as one, but then the optimization as, as the other one. And this is a multi-parameter optimization. It's a multi-input, and it's a multi-output. It's, it's not a single output, yeah? because you have the electric field, you have the temperature, you have the pain, you have the coughing, you have the, you know, all of that, and you have here. So, can you do all of that without us academics? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So I just have one other thought, um, just to um, add to your, um, your pleading. Um, look, <laughs> So the, the companies, understandably, the companies don't want to disclose, and I get it. I mean, they spend huge amounts of money, and they're for-profit companies, and they'll probably get killed by their board if they disclosed it if they didn't have to. But there is a reason for them to consider doing it for, um, for their reason, right? Instead of keeping it as a trade secret, where, again, everyone is going to be looking at their waveform with an oscilloscope right as soon as it gets approved, it, it might be beneficial to at least try to get some degree of protection of their waveform, right? If you just keep it as a trade secret, anybody can copy it as, as soon, right as soon as it gets uh, approved in any regulatory environment. So that is a potential reason, right? I'm just, I'm just curious, um, Scott or, or um, uh, Daniel, what your thoughts are about that? <clears throat> or is it just I mean, I that to, I that to our legal group. <laughs> <laughs> Vivek, I can, I can tell you, they have the yeah. IP. I'm sure they have the IP. The problem with the IP is you only know how strong it is once you challenge it. So I think that's a, a, a very, you know, that's, that's a big step. You want to go and try to find out how, how strong your, is your protection against somebody else? I think that's uh, something that they want to avoid. They no, you no, don't need I, to say I, yes. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe another comment is, you know, from from David Hazelwood's talk, you know, we have our own body of data. We can then reference the magnitude of change off of that. So in working with regulators, right, we're often working within our own, you know, PMA file. And so it's often, right, what becomes a significant change that warrants clinical 
additional clinical investigation, and whether we can meet that with some combination of other non-clinical pathway tools. So I don't know that that's ever going to be where another competitor can come and, and just simply right, use your file or use, but they can learn quickly from you, which is what we want to prevent. Yeah, but I mean, if you just take the waveform and you don't use the same catheter, it's not going to work. Yeah, we can and, do that, yeah. And so if you copy the waveform and the catheter, then you can go after them anyway. So. Wait, but Damien, wait, I'm sorry, just I want to understand. So is that really true that these have been um, applied for patents? Because that does get published, right? They are published. You can read them. I have. <laughs> ah. But just not with enough detail that you could copy it. Is that your point? Uh, and, you know, it's from two. In in the patent application, it's always the way from from here to here and so on. And this is and they have overlapping claims. It's not enough to yeah. steal it, but enough to do basic research. There's a lot of information available out there. Yeah. So we, we anyway we do basic research. Yeah. We we to be honest, I'm not Take I'm not pleading. We have plenty of work to do. <laughs> uh, I think I think though that. Uh, the other point to be made about five, six years is the reality is, and I know this is going to sound bad for the companies, but the PFA is going to become really commoditized, right? Like it's everyone's going to have their PFA. Uh, the, the novelty will wear off. It'll become a competitive, you know, price driven, margin driven market. It won't be as bad as stents, but you know, it'll 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 get there, and I think as as the the margins drop and as the competition increases, the the desire to protect some of these things is gonna is gonna fall because it's not gonna be everyone will have had uh, will have a mature PFA program, so you don't have to protect to the same degree because everyone's gonna have their full. PMA file, everyone's going to have their own thing. So, you know, who's who's left to kind of catch up or compete with you? There's already six or seven competitors. Yeah, I think it's going to be like any technology, right? Like <clears throat> a, a defibrillators, right, at the beginning, and there's going to be a huge curve, and at some point that flattens out. But there will still be innovations. It will be just more incremental. And, and, and it will probably won't be the waveform. Or to, to, it's going to be important, but maybe not. You but know. the defibrillator waveforms at the very beginning, you yes. know, there was some exactly. secrecy about yeah. that. And yeah. Now, yeah, exactly right. Now everybody we talked about that at lunch yeah. today. So it's gonna, how, long did, how long did it take? For defibrillators? It was pretty fast, actually, like okay. in yeah. seven to ten years. Probably so, okay. so. I was I was checking the, the, the questions on, on the chat, so just allow me to go through those which I think we did not address, because we will have to wrap up. We, we, we are rather long mm -hmm. already, and the people, I think, are getting... So there was one uh, 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 item on, on David Hazelwood's uh, uh, slide that we didn't really address, at least that's my arrhythmia induction. Can we can we tell anything about that? Uh, are we concerned about that? Is this not of concern at all? Because we, we know we can you know we can stop the beating of the heart with the nine volt nine volt battery easily. So uh, I don't think it's a big concern. No, uh, I think in the ventricle synchronization. No, no synchronization. Yeah, I, think, I think in the ventricle synchronization will be very important. Yeah. Uh, and most of the companies, for conservative purposes, have also put sync in the atrium anyway, yeah. right? Uh, not everyone has, but in the atrium, if you're far away from the valve, I, mean, you know, uh, I think if we were going to be inducing a lot of ventricular arrhythmias, we would have seen it. Yeah. So. Anybody wants to add on this? The, I think it is a, it's, it's not fully answered. There's a bias because the guys who are doing these procedures are cardiac electrophysiologists and we commonly put people in the VF intentionally anyway. And, uh, you know, we know how to manage heart block. In the 1980s, when people were doing DC ablation, there was reports of transient heart block that occurred um, uh, unintentionally. 
most of the time would recover uh, quickly. And I've seen it a lot of times in animals with that part of it. There's the induction of BT and BF and um, AFib and all kinds of other arrhythmias in animal models that may be and, and, uh, has occurred on very rare occasions in, in human applications. But uh, but I, I, I think that uh, the synchrony question, especially in the ventricle, is going to be kind of I, I would like to add one more thing to this, and it goes back to, I mean, what Tony was showing, and we know also from our uh, primary cardio, cardiomyocyte work, when you do deliver the pulses, uh, and, and this is evident also from the disappearance of the uh, bipolar signal or the reduction, you transiently actually prevent the 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 the, the uh, action potential triggering and, and conduction. So that, of course, extends way beyond the reverse, irreversible zone of damage. And so now, is that something that, you know, I, I think, Vivek, you, you've suggested recently that this is a new way of, you know, identifying the substrate which is uh, responsible. So I think you called it the uh, Pulse field mapping or something? Yeah, something like that. I mean, look, in electrophysiology, like when we're talking about circuits, we use different approaches, right, to confirm that an area is critical. Um, people have used it with cryo, for example, trying to cool the tissue. It works, sort of, but it's not as effective. This seems to be highly effective. Again, our experience is early, but it's a, it's a, it's a, um, I think, a nice use for pulse electrical fields. I think there's lots of stuff to still learn. How big is that zone of reversible? How long does it last? How much of it is truly reversible versus some degree of necrosis? I mean, there's a lot of questions. And when we talk about the reversibility, I think we need to have a, 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 a little bit of uh, agreement. Yeah. So one, we say it's irreversible yes. because the cells die. Then we say it's reversible. And in our community of electroporation, that means that the cells will recover, and we can detect that. And Eberhard alluded to that before. It's it's depending on what you use as a as a dye as 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 the scope to actually see the reversibility. And I think the lowest reversibility uh, uh, scope or the dye is something like calcium, sodium, potassium. And uh, I don't know, Leah, if you want to comment on how far these three are when you start to play with excitable cells? Just in, you know. But I, I can't quantify it. I know, but is it, is it close by? Is it no, far? It's far? It's very far. So meaning, when you say very far, meaning you do the non, you induce the non-excitability much earlier than what we usually say reversible. You basically don't detect electroporation with classical indicators at that point where you already see an alteration, yes. So that translates into large zone of silent cardiomyocytes, at least for some part of the time. Well, I think, you know, for EPs are looking at endocardial tracings of electrograms, which um, is partially a cell with a negative inward potential and depolarization. But what we're really seeing is propagation of yeah. that signal. And there are other mechanisms. For instance, if you have an MI, you have a penumbra around the area where the pH changes and the calcium handling changes and you shut down the gap junctions between the cells. And therefore, you, even though your cell may have a negative inward potential and it's fully capable of being polarized, it does not propagate. So makes it even, that, and I, and that makes it even more difficult because we know from other studies that gap junctions are affected too with electroporation. It takes 0 0.01 millimolar difference in the in, in, mm -hmm. uh, inward calcium to, to shut down those things. It takes over 30, 45 minutes for the gap junction to recover. Damian, I would like to quote Damian. You, you would like no, to quote me? No. Yeah. yeah. There are no problems, there are only challenges. Okay. <laughs> and this is in a, in a concept that if you can manage to bring together mm -hmm. controversies about reversibility and irreversibility in the context of the observation that the electroporated membrane shell 
is a self-inductor makes from stationary field oscillations. And this combines the two aspects of uh, reversible electroporation and irreversible uh, electroporation. And in a nutshell, we have a low field pathway of making electropores at weak sites, shorter lipids and studs, and a high field electroporation pathway where the nucleation center for Cosmos are communicated by peroxidized uh, lipid frequency. So I call this pause the Lewis pause because it was active in the, this part. Now, then you may say, well, what is the problem? The problem is that if you uh, are on the pathway of low field and millisec microsecond milliseconds and repeat it, because of the uh, low field longevity of uh, the force, you accumulate the path. And if you do it long enough, you see that the second pathways appear. And this is the reason that for oscillation. Yeah. So since oscillation is a principle, in principle it was a hysteresis loop of receding and so on, you surrounding this loop is equivalent to make stationarity into an oscillative uh, part. And I was uh, addressing to Paul <clears throat> that you use differential equations first order. So you have per event two, in the, uh, two uh, boundary conditions. If you take second order differentials, you have four. So I wonder whether all these parameters can be put into a matrix and then you get uh, vector algebra in the bathroom, you get a uh, uh, RC time constant, which is unique for this whole uh, part. Maybe a way of uh, uh, combining that electroporation is also a mechanochemical effect. The membrane thins in a field okay. and uh, makes elongations and so yeah. on. So there are various aspects which are not yet considered, and I would like to draw your attention to uh, uh, a little bit in, into this direction. Thank you, Eberhard. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So I would like to end up with one slide. It was actually my slide, the final slide at the ERA in, in Barcelona. Uh, and I don't know whether you agree, uh, uh, Atul and, 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 and Vivek, of course, uh, I assume there are some uh, uh, needs, uh, of course, uh, of integration, how this will be integrated, whether you know the mapping will be part of it. Will, will we be able to develop some sort of uh, uh, interprocedural guidance like ablation index for for RFA? Uh, now with the PFA, I think it would be it would be actually excellent because right now my understanding is you get a clear indic you clear. Uh, uh, instructions on how to place and how to rotate and how many times you press the button and pretty much you follow that that's that's my understanding so mm, not very smart way yeah uh, I mean it's, it has been perfected to some extent but maybe there's something you know uh, that we can uh, uh, develop. Now, comparing different systems is going to be a, a problem. This is something I, I have seen not much, actually, on MRI at, at all, and LGE. How does the... Recently, there was an attempt of trying to, you know, reconcile what, what should we see, what would we see on uh, after PFA on, on, on the LGE. So I think there's a lot that still needs to be done. And all in all, I think what we have learned uh, 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 over the years now, and I think we have, is that we need to start to look at PFA not with the eyes of the RFA and cryo, because they, it does not behave as, as RFA and, and cryo. It does not induce the same challenges and, and problems and side effects. So it, it needs to be actually, you need friends who are able to look 
with the eyes of the PFA. And I think that would be, uh, uh, at least from my point of view, that would be a, 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 a message. And I hope, Xenia, uh, if you want to add anything, because we started this idea together, please. I'd love to. Yeah, that was super, super helpful. Thank you to all participants. My list of potential concerns grew a couple of items. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> What I'm struggling with is really ranking those potential concerns, right? It's probably a little bit subjective. Someone, you know, is more concerned about bubbles and other, I don't know, autoimmune response. Um, I feel like we'll probably need to follow up with uh, some type of questionnaire trying to rank them, right? What do you believe is the most addressable or most important deficiency right now, right? We, we cannot possibly do all of them, right? So... Yeah, thanks. So uh, with respect to the questions and answers, we have an online uh, questionnaire that you can still put the question in. So uh, all of you, you received the link to the questions, put questions in. If you have the ideas, we can follow up on that for some time. If there's not going to be a lot, then we will not really follow this for a longer time. So we'll keep it up for another week and then we'll, we'll close it down. So with that, thank you all for being patient, for being with us, and thank you all for contributing.